Hello and welcome to the Wise Worldwide Online Expo 2021 Day 2. Thanks for joining us. I uh, hope everyone out there is doing great. Ah, it was nice to see folks yesterday uh, when we started this exciting live stream event. Uh, we'll do a little recap on yesterday here in a minute and and go over what we'll be talking about today on day two. Uh, but I just want to say welcome. Uh, it's great to be here. Uh, my name is Damien Kaspauer, Software Product Manager here at Audio Kinetic. And we're going to be talking about new features for WISE 2021.1. Uh, this is available today. You can jump up on audiokinetic.com. Uh, get the latest version and try out these features. Uh, and we're excited for you to do so. I want to give a shout out to all the presenters on day one. Uh, they brought some incredibly rich information about features uh, in the newest version. We'll go over those, but uh, tremendous job to all our presenters yesterday. And you know, part of this live stream is bringing the talent behind what we do here at Audio Kinetic and the result of which arrives to you uh, in, in WISE. And so it's a, a pleasure to be able to bring the people behind these features. Uh, again, a small portion of the larger team that it takes to pull off each release. And uh, it's, it's great to be able to bring those people to you, uh, have them share their knowledge and have them speak from a, a place of deep experience. I'm thankful for that. So I also wanna give a shout out to our teams in Asia and China and Japan who are taking our live stream and rebroadcasting that for their audiences, uh, leveraging auto captioning and, uh, and answering questions uh, that, that they have uh, during these rebroadcasts. They're doing a great job over there and I want to give thanks to them. Speaking of which, if you're in our chat here, uh, we're looking for engagement. If you have questions that come up uh, during the live stream, uh, put them in. Um, there's folks from Audio Kinetic who are, you know, standing standing by to, to help guide the conversation and engage throughout this uh, day two live stream event. So uh, thanks to that. I'll also say stay tuned uh, because we'll have a break at the midday and at the end where we'll publish a Discord server link that you can jump into uh, different breakout rooms uh, related to feature areas that we'll talk about today to get some real-time Q&A going. So with that, I want to start looking at the schedule. So good to see folks in the chat. Cheers. Uh, here we go. Uh, day one. We did it. Yeah. Awesome. Nice work, everyone. Uh, moving on to day two. This is the introduction, uh, and we're going to launch into a discussion about Wise Automotive. We got a huge plate full of spatial audio that we're going to talk after that, uh, leading all the way up to the break. Things like uh, fitting rooms and portals to geometry, automating aux buses, uh, rooms and portals accessibility, and spatial audio CPU limit. And again, that'll take us right up to the break. And at that time, we'll get that Discord server link out in the chat. Uh, you can join in at, at breakout rooms to discuss um, you know, these feature areas. We'll have folks from Audio Kinetic in the breakout rooms to talk more about Wise Automotive and Spatial Audio uh, in order to, yeah, answer your questions. Uh, another cool thing there is that um, really great conversations in yesterday's breakout rooms. Um, we uh, talked about uh, object-based audio. We talked about um, just lots of great stuff. So. Definitely try to join in for that if you can. 
In the second half of day two, we're going to talk about our integrations, uh, Unity Addressables, a new experimental feature that's part of 21.1. We're going to talk about the use of WAPI in Unity. And if you didn't catch it yesterday uh, during our WAPI and Wackle uh, presentation, let me break those acronyms down for you. WAPI, Wise Authoring API, Wackle, Wise Authoring Query Language. You remember those, right? Uh, and we're going to talk about the use of WAPI in Unity today. Um, we're going to have support talking about staying up to date with WISE. Um, Mike from Business Development is going to talk about registering a project and evaluating plugins. And then we're going to have a whole uh, section focused on education, resources, certification, and team training uh, in order to get skilled up and schooled on the ins and outs of WISE and its use. So I hope you are all comfortable because it's going to be a fantastic day at the WISE Worldwide Online Expo. And I just want to start it out by saying, if you've been wondering what the future of interactive audio is, it might be this. Or uh, let me introduce Francois Thibault. Good morning, Francois. <laughs> I'm doing great. Uh, welcome to the live stream. It's so great to have you here starting off day two. Um, great to see you. Uh, tell me a little bit about your role at Audio Kinetic. We're going to talk about automotive today, but also uh, wise usage in devices are, are, is something that is uh, addressed by the innovation team at Audio Kinetic. Great, and you're the innovation team lead uh, heading up all of these fascinating special projects at Audio Kinetic, uh, one of which is Wise Automotive. Correct. And basically today's presentation is, is a little bit different from from the rest of the presentation in this uh, in this event, in the sense that mainly what we want to do uh, with with the little time that that we have is is plant the idea that the same tool set, the wise tool, can be used uh, 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 differently to uh, serve different uh, interactive audio requirements that exist in 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 applications outside of gaming. And, and today we're going to use automotive kind of as an example, as a rethinking of how WISE can enable uh, applications on that side of things. I know, like WISE in your car, it's the craziest thing, but also not that crazy because when we think about all of the interactions that we have uh, in a vehicle uh, across the different ways that we interact today, uh, it seems like kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a. In my presentation, I, I will discuss the model of interactivity, and and we see that there are uh, some some uh, clear parallels between uh, uh, the, uh, how we interact uh, with, with game audio and and how we can interact with different systems in a car, and what are the the different needs there in in, in uh, automotive for for our interactive audio. Awesome. Uh, well, I'm ready to hand the presentation off to you. Uh, take it away. Thank you. All right. So um, basically, the the agenda today, uh, I want to uh, have a look at what's similar, but also what's different for uh, doing game audio, which uh, uh, all of you are familiar with. And, and how does this translate into the automotive audio, the kind of requirements and the, the kind of uh, interactions that are required there. So there's a, uh, this is a, a vast field of application and uh, to make it more concrete and a, a bit more fun as well, uh, we want to uh, show a, um, a quick uh, demonstration video where we'll show how uh, uh, we can have audio branded um, engine sound generation that's used for 
uh, pedestrian safety outside the vehicles, uh, mostly electric vehicles. And basically, uh, this is going to be the perfect segue into the second part of the presentation where we have a, a special guest uh, from, from season three, uh, Audio is a sound designer. He's going to tell us uh, more about uh, using uh, electric vehicle sound and sharing his experience doing so in, in WISE as well. So that's, uh, that's going to be the second part of the presentation. So let me, uh, let me uh, dive in um, immediately. So I want to take it very high level at this point. This presentation is not going to be technical, uh, but basically to show uh, some parallels between uh, the gaming world and the automotive world. So if you look at both ends uh, uh, of this diagram, basically you have the same uh, uh, human interaction uh, triggering, uh, in the case of a game, through the controller and the game systems. In the end, that results in wise runtime events and some sound playback. So that's the part that you very well know. Let's look at what this means uh, in the in the automotive world. So in the automotive world, you have uh, a driver uh, that's uh, perhaps stepping on a gas pedal. This information is uh, uh, transferred to uh, uh, vehicle network systems. We often call those CAN buses. It gets to one of the uh, many onboard computing cap uh, capabilities could be the infotainment platform where WISE is uh, embedded and basically can trigger sound feedback for the driver. The, uh, uh, it could be uh, also other systems uh, in the car. So not necessarily the driver directly triggering things, but it could be uh, uh, things like um, radar systems, LIDAR cameras. Those are very common. Uh, in, in modern vehicles, uh, triggering a, a collision warning system, for example. So there's a lot of different uh, sound requirements within the vehicle, and we're going to try to look at that later in the presentation. So another approach where uh, I want to show uh, a fundamental difference between uh, game audio and automotive audio is that in a game, it's usually a foreground application, and basically there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the game and the WISE runtime, and the, the WISE runtime itself is embedded in the application package itself. Things are very different for the automotive uh, world, where what we do with the WISE runtime there, uh, it's uh, packaged uh, more of, as a service or as a, as a platform extension that can service a multitude of different application. It could be media playback, safety kind of application. It could be uh, augmenting uh, navigation with some auditory cues that are useful for the driver. But all of those applications essentially run in the background and WISE needs to be available to all of these applications at all times uh, to service the different uh, interactive audio requirements that they might have. Another angle on which I want to, to, to look at those differences and similarities between uh, the gaming world and the automotive world is that, well, so in, in, in a gaming world using middleware, there's the sound designer uh, using the wise authoring, creating data package sound banks that are consumed by the runtime component. As you know, the sound integrator hooks the triggers, the different events and RTPCs. And because those two are usually in the same company, they can communicate easily. Uh, ideal, uh, ideally, this leads to a great sounding game. But that's really far from the situation in, a, in the automotive industry. So you have car manufacturers that are deeply interested in the sound design aspects. They have sound designer on staff. Um, and basically, they want to control the sound experiences and the audio signature and everything like that. But the integrators usually uh, in a, a, an external company, uh, some kind of supplier, there's a, it's a really deep and complex supply chain in automotive. And they communicate through requirements and 
SOWs and all of these, these things, as, as you probably guess, are very inefficient, costly, and long, and, and in our view, doesn't lead to um, uh, the, the, the best possible sounding experience, sound experience in your car. So what we, what we see in the automotive industry is that this uh, uh, separation of roles that, that middleware like WISE provides with a data-driven approach and event abstractions and things like that is even more important because it completely changes the game. So you can have the car manufacturer designers communicate uh, just uh, basically the the sync the Y sync IDs uh, the um, the events and the RTPC names and things like that that are still integrated by the audio integrator in, a, in an external company. But once that's done, uh, the OEMs are now in full control of the experimentation, changing the the, the sound, the behaviors, all of that. So it's very empowering for. Uh, the car manufacturers to have a data-driven approach uh, in the loop. And basically, uh, uh, this brings a lot of uh, efficiency and, and cost savings. Um, going down, like, so this presentation is kind of a funnel where we go more and more specifically into the, 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 the automotive uh, features. And, and really, there's two class of sound requirements for automotive. The first one is uh, group under interactive sound generation. So that's where you have like engine, vehicle sounds, things like that. This is the part that we'll focus on in the second part of this presentation with Carlos. So I, I'm, I'm going to skip here. But you have all sorts of uh, touch screen interaction and overall HMI feedback. And sometimes there's no screen. So the only way to interact with the user is through sound. And this is where features that, that you know and love, like switch containers, for example, can be used uh, to uh, create different audio profiles, or audio themes. So perhaps when I get into my car, uh, different key fob, I, uh, car remembers my, my, my profile setting, and I get a completely different sounding experience, H, uh, HMI-wise, than uh, uh, my, my wife, for example. Um, another very critical feature of interactive audio for automotive is uh, with respect to uh, sound spatialization. So all of the, the safety warnings in the car, uh, for example, the camera can detect that there's uh, uh, an object, perhaps in, even in my blind spot, so I don't know about that, uh, uh, that object. And uh, basically sound can be used and sound spatialization specifically, in particular, if you have uh, headrest speakers and the driver and binaural capabilities, then I can really focus the driver and let them be aware that there is a, a, a car in their blind spot, for example, as they're trying to overtake. So all the idea of sound spatialization plays a really a vital role in automotive audio applications. The second class of uh, 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 requirements for automotive audio is more with respect to audio management. And that's where we need to handle all of different concurrent streams uh, going on in the car at the same time. So uh, it can uh, be with respect to routing. Uh, for example, we have uh, 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 media playback or, or uh, incoming calls, say, uh, hands-free and the calls for my wife, uh, swipe gesture to the passenger seat. Um, the audio is transferred over using Oxen, listener assignments and whatnot and wise. And all of this audio is dynamically flowing from different zones uh, within the vehicle. There's all the idea of um, prioritizing uh, these streams with things like volume ducking. So I have the navigation uh, prompt, uh, I want to use features like auto docking or perhaps side chaining so that I can reduce the media playback. Uh, this is again falls under audio management um, category. 
And perhaps one last one I, I want to mention is, is a feature of the authoring, but it's extremely useful in, in automotive, is the fact that uh, you can use uh, custom platforms to create as many uh, platform uh, variations as you need. And, and the reason that, that this is uh, useful is that uh, car manufacturers have a lot of uh, different models that are very similar, but uh, sometimes different through their audio um, uh, audio upgrade, for example. Uh, there can be some different geography with different requirements. So this creates a lot of different configurations to support. And, and using custom platform and platform unlinking to tune uh, uh, some specific variations allowed to keep uh, a single wise project managing all of these for uh, the common elements while being able to tune the, the specific variations. So um, I want to make it uh, uh, more concrete. So uh, next we'll uh, have a, a quick uh, video demonstration about um, uh, engine sound generation for pedestrian safety. Uh, it's called Avas. Uh, Carlos is going to uh, uh, discuss that in more details. But first, uh, we, we would like to, to uh, see a, a video where it becomes clear uh, to me that same car, same situation, uh, but just by changing the sound design, uh, you completely change the, the sound identity. And uh, so um, Damien is going to play the video. Uh, that's, uh, that's the end of, of my part. And after the, the video, uh, we'll have uh, Carlos Rodriguez of season three. He's the creator of the sounds you're going to hear in the, the video. And he's going to discuss more about the requirements in creating electric vehicle sounds and his experience doing so in, in WISE. So, yeah, thank you. Hello, everyone. Mm. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Hands up. Yeah, sure. So, my name is Carlos. I worked uh, together with Francois to create the video that you just said, the, these AVAS examples for three different sound profiles. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about my experience working with WISE and the whole experience of designing sound for an electric vehicle. And first, we need to know what is AVAS. It's, it's called Acoustic Vehicle Alerting System. And it's an external sound that is played uh, by outside the speakers, plays usually on the front, at the back, and, and in the front and the back of the car. And is mostly defined by law in different countries since 2019. So there are parameters that are fixed and is 0.8% per, uh, per of pitch shifting per kilometer. It's usually up to uh, 32 kilometers an hour. The frequency band that it needs to play on is, is defined as well. It must be a continuous sound when driving forward and we cannot use nature sound or sounds 
uh, that could be recognized as nature sounds. So we cannot use rain or wind because it needs to be identified as a vehicle. Mm. This is one part of the sound identity for electric vehicles, but it's comprised of AVAS, the UI UX sound constellation, and another sound that we'll talk later. But what are the characteristics that uh, a sound identity for a car must have or should have? I would say it needs to be safe for the pedestrians, the visually impaired cyclists, and the driver, of course, is the main priority. Then it needs to be useful. It needs to convey the information and it needs, it's done, it's used daily. So it needs to be something that is not annoying and that we can live with it daily. So it needs to be something that is really useful. Then it needs to be respect, respectful with the acoustic ecology of the cities. If we are removing combustion engines that are a lot, a lot noisier, we cannot go and make a lot of noise with our new electric vehicles. It needs to be respectful with that as well. It needs to be cohesive. The sound gestures and the sound signature needs to be tied together and in the end, it needs to be branded. It has to be lines in line with the manufacturer's vision. It has to translate very well to other models and equipment tiers. And the most important, it needs to be recognizable and memorable. You're on the street and you might, able, might be able to identify, OK, this is such brand. This is such model. This is the goal. That's the theory. How we do develop as an identity from start to the end as a sound designer, as a branding expert in this case. So there is a brand, there's a maker of cars that has some values, has a message, has a history, a vision, and a mission. And they release, or they are creating a new vehicle model, has some characteristics and qualities. Is it going to be a very powerful car? Is it going to be a family van? Is it going to be a SUV? There is some characteristics that the model is going to have. And then there's a target audience for that vehicle. The market, is it going to be only for the Asian market? Is it going to be for the North American market? Mm, what is the segment? Is it going to be wealthy suburban? Mm, wealthy suburban? Is it going to be city, young city, pe pe people living in, in small cities? What is the target audience? With these three ideas, we are able, as sound designers, to con conceive a sound identity core. So. With th through different workshops that we uh, do with the with the with the brand, we establish certain sounds that we can correlate to these characteristics, and we create a sound entity core. Then we look at the user journey. How is the user going to interact with his his or her new car? Mm, is it going to be mostly driven from and to the mall? Is it are you going to take the kids to school? Is it a very powerful car that you're going to take into the racetrack, maybe. So based on this user journey, we model this identity and we apply it into the different applications that a, that a car can have. That's AVAS, the external sound we just talked, that that's mandatory. Then we have the UX, UI, sound constellation. And what that is, is all of the sounds that create feedback for the driver in an active or a passive way. That's the warning, mm, Courtesy sounds like welcome, goodbye, lock, and lock. And driving modes, of course. Are we driving in echo? Are we driving in sport? Are we driving in, in comfort mode? All of this needs to be represented in the sound of the car. There is also a mobile app with all cars that has to, has to have the same sound identity. And there are equipment lines. So if you have a GTR line from a car, it needs to be more aggressive than a normal car because it's going to be a different kind of segment. Mm -hmm. This is the theory. How did we do it for what, what, what you just heard in the, in the video? We had three profiles, urban, comfort, and performance. The first one, we envisioned a compact EV for the Asian market. The sound identity focus was safety. And in this car, we took as a reference the Honda E. And this car is done with organic natural material. So we say, OK, for this sound identity, we're going to use organic instruments. And we use flute, piano, strings, this kind of pads, and apply them to the AVAS and the, in the UX UI sounds. For the comfort one, we were thinking about a small, a small SUV for the European market, because it's very popular at the moment. And buyers in Europe are young, 
they are looking for smart features. Uh, they are very conscious about uh, sustainability. So we're going to focus about this digital acoustic ecology. And we use for that warm, digital, and analog scenes. And lastly, uh, the, the last one for performance, we envision a luxury sedan for the North American market, making long, long drives at high speed, has a lot of horsepower, has a lot of range, a lot of megawatts. But where do megawatts come from? It's not about gas anymore, it's about electricity. And where do, does electricity come from? From turbines. So we use a lot of turbines from our generators, from uh, hydraulic turbines as well, uh, electric guitars, uh, square waves, everything that made it sound very gritty and very powerful. So this is the actual thing, the actual praxis of how do we do the sounds, how do we apply this theory? Then we needed to work with WISE. How does WISE and the vehicle understand each other? It's uh, a, the car is another stream of a stream of information. So we use three speed, uh, three streams or three parameters from the car. That would be speed, pedal position, and load. And each of them we mapped to an RTPC in in WISE. The speed would affect the pitch, pedal position, how much are we accelerating or not, because we can be very fast in a, a go, going down, but we are not accelerating too much. So it would trigger different layers that we created in WISE, or the load uh, would apply different volume to the, the different layers. There is also all of the one-shot triggers for the sound constellation. The all notification sounds like it could be a state of charge, dead angle warning, another warning sounds that like you are falling asleep. There is always a warning sound when you are falling asleep in the car because there is driver monitoring. There are also feedback sounds, active feedback sounds. When you lock and unlock the car, when you change driving state from park to drive uh, to neutral, when you change driving mode, so you put it in sport mode, you need to have feedback for an action that you just did. And then there are experience sounds like that they round up the experience of the car, the usual experience of the car, like welcome, goodbye, all of these sounds that are courtesy sounds, so to say. And now the final, the final Ava sound design in WISE, how did we do it? You see a screenshot of the, of the, um, the project. And what we did is layering with a lot of different materials. So we have fundamental waves, like sine waves and square waves that create harmonic parcels, or what is called in the combustion engine world, called orders. So that's uh, the harmonics, the physics of the actual engine will create vibrations that are like partials in the harmonic scale. And this is the same that happens when you combine sine and square waves. So we'll create this distortion and harmony at the same time, and we will get this similarity to how we identify a car, a combustion engine car, and translate it into the electric world. Then we use a lot of seamless loops because uh, that functioning wise works very, very well. So we use our loops imported from, from the DAW that we cr create uh, from the sound signature. So we say in the first example, for example, we used uh, flutes, strings, and uh, piano to create that, that loop. And we imported that into a, into, a, into a seamless loop. Then we have the layering because we not, we don't want to have it very static. So based on the pedal position, we will trigger different, different, um, different layers with different volumes. And in the end, the car is a live thing. So it needs to feel alive and have a lot of dynamism. That's why with LFOs, we can change the sound. And we can also add sweeteners, what we call sweeteners that will be based on a specific scenario of driving. We will add a special one shot uh, when, for example, you're going very fast and you make a stop and you floor it again. We will add a special sonic boom for that time or we would add especially mm, created sounds for the launch mode. You know, the electric vehicles have a lot of torque. So when we launch it uh, from zero to 60 to make it in under two seconds, it's going to be a very powerful experience. So we need to add some experience to that as well. 
what does this mean for you, this world for sound designers? There's a lot of opportunities because it's, uh, the game sound design skills transfer very well to the automotive world because you're bringing a lot of innovation. You're bringing a creative workflow into an engineering environment and you are able to work as sound designers way faster than the engineers. That means the turnover that you can have with different designs and try it out and test it is going to be much faster and everyone is going to be very satisfied. And uh, it's a multidisciplinary world as is uh, game audio because it's sound design in one part, of course, but it's also ex user experience. There's also safety. It's, a, it's very important for marketing as well because in some of the more exotic cars, sound is going to be a key point for, for selling, for marketing. But what I want you to take away from this whole experience is like electric vehicles and design is still a blank slate and there's a lot to be said and there's a lot to experiment and this has just started and I invite you all to look into it because it's a very interesting world and I hope I see you later on Discord and tell me how will you make our world sound like in the future. Thank you. Carlos, awesome. So great to get your perspective from out on the edge, you know, helping to define the sounds of these electric vehicles. And uh, the, the video is up on our YouTube channel if you want to revisit some of those sounds. And again, I thought the way you broke down um, the different considerations for, you know, market and, you know, use cases uh, across mm -hmm. the different techniques that you used it was really fascinating and great to have that experience shared with uh, wise artists and authors out there who, yeah, as you have invited them to imagine this future of automotive with us, um, again, thank you for sharing your perspective on that. Thank you for inviting me to tell you all of this. Thank you. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so here we go. Uh, we are off to a great start. Fantastic presentations from Francois and Carlos on the automotive and innovation side of what we're doing here at Audio Kinetic. And the next thing I want to do is I want to roll a video from the spatial audio team outlining some of the cool new features in WISE 21.1. And we're going to come back after that video and get some more detail on these features from the designers at Audio Kinetic, the developers who have worked to create these features for you in WISE 21.1. Rooms, portals, late reverb and geometry have all been fully componentized such that audio environments can be built in a modular fashion and reused throughout the level. In this example I am editing the blueprint for a building asset. I first add a box collision component and line it up with the bottom room of the building. I then attach an AK room component, AK geometry component and AK late reverb component. I then add another box collision component and line it up with the entrance doorway. To this box component I attach an AK portal component. With the blueprint structure set up I can now save and compile and instantiate multiple instances in my level. Notice the red portal visualization, indicating that the portal placement is invalid. For aligning rooms and portals, a new Visualize Rooms and Portals option has been added to the integration settings, which can be used to visualize all of the rooms and portals in the level and their connections. Enabling this, I see that both front and back rooms of the portals are connected to the outside room because it has a higher priority than my AK room component in the blueprint. I open the blueprint to update the priority of the AK room component. Notice that the Visualize Rooms and Portals option applies to the Blueprint viewport as well as the Level viewport. Going back to the level, the portals are now shown as valid. When working with existing level geometry, to which you want to add rooms, portals, reverbs and acoustic geometry, the Spatial Audio Volume and Acoustic Portal actors can be used. For fitting Spatial Audio Volumes and Acoustic Portals to existing geometry, a new Fit to Geometry feature has been added.
When fit to geometry is enabled, simply position your volume close to the geometry and it will automatically snap into place. As you move the volume, the calculated fit is highlighted in yellow. Releasing the mouse button will snap the volume to this new fit. The feature supports axis aligned boxes, oriented boxes and convex polyhedrons. It is also possible to reduce the search space within which the geometry fit is estimated. Here I am fitting a spatial audio volume to partially open geometry, so I reduce the search space to avoid distant geometry being used in the fit. In this example I add an acoustic portal actor and use the fit to geometry feature to align it with the doorway of the building. Again, I need to update the priority value of the room component in the spatial audio volume such that it takes precedence over the outside room. The late reverb component has a new auto assign aux bus feature. This allows the reverb component to automatically be assigned an aux bus determined by the size and shape of its primitive parent. In this example, the late reverb component is attached to a box collision component. Scaling the primitive parent automatically updates the aux bus assigned to the late reverb component. This means that with spatial audio volumes, when using fit to geometry, the reverb aux bus is automatically updated as the volume is fit to different environments. The aux bus assignment is controlled via the aux bus assignment map in the integration settings. The reverb decay value is estimated from the size and shape of the volume and this is used to determine the appropriate aux bus. As well as decay, the late reverb component can estimate the time to first reflection or pre-delay value as well as the high frequency damping value using an AK geometry component's associated acoustic textures. These values can be used to dynamically drive a reverb effect in WISE via the global reverb RTPCs in the integration settings. Here, I add three new RTPCs to my WISE project, and then assign them in the integration settings in Unreal. I then hook up the RTPCs to a reverb effect. Now I can use the same aux bus for multiple different environments in my level and drive the reverb parameters via the global reverb RTPCs. Hello! 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 When working with custom blueprints, the HF damping value is calculated using the AK geometry component. In this example, I have an AK geometry component and a late reverb component attached to a static mesh. The mesh is hidden and is only used to provide material slots for acoustic textures. It contains material slots for the walls, ceiling, and floor, and the AK geometry component assigns corresponding acoustic textures for each of these materials. The late reverb component uses an aux bus that has the global reverb RTPCs mapped to the reverb effect parameters. When the blueprint is instantiated in the level, the HF damping value is calculated using the acoustic textures assigned to the AK geometry component. When these textures are changed, the HF damping value is updated. Here I add two instances of the blueprint. I increase their size to accentuate the reverb and change the acoustic textures assigned to their geometry components in order to demonstrate how this affects the HF damping parameter on the reverb effect. Note that both of these reverb environments are using the same aux bus.
It is also possible to attach an AK geometry component to a simple collision component, such as a box. In this case, there is just one acoustic texture applied to each surface. Acoustic textures can also be used with the spatial audio volume actors placed in the level. Acoustic texture assignment in the spatial audio volume has been simplified. Textures can now be edited directly on the object using the Edit Surfaces button. And multiple textures can be edited at once. In this example, I duplicate some existing geometry, as well as the spatial audio volume for that geometry. Fitting the duplicated spatial audio volume over the new geometry, I then change the acoustic texture applied to all of the surfaces in order to demonstrate the effect on the reverb. All right, what an incredible rundown of spatial audio goodness. Uh, joining me today, I've got Sean Shorgahan and Nate Harris. Welcome to the live stream, folks. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Uh, Nate, I think you need to unmute in Teams. Yep, uh, if I didn't join uh, muted, I would have been breaking tradition, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for acknowledging uh, that historic precedent that we've set here. Uh, it's great to have you today. Thanks so much, and thanks for your time uh, to talk more about all the cool features of spatial audio in WISE 21.1. I'm going to hand it off to you for a presentation, and you're going to start running us through some of the cool things that are, uh, that are coming. Do you want to talk a bit about that while you're getting your screen shared over in Teams? Um, sure. So... Um, basically, I mean, you guys just saw that awesome video, um, and what I'm going to do is uh, show you how you can fit geometry to your world in Unreal, um, in real time, sort of fumble through uh, the placement of these actors, and um, yeah, we'll... we'll uh, see how it goes. Great. I'll let you take um, it away. Thanks so much. Roll. All right, so I've just got a little uh, little demo map here, um, and right now there's no rooms and no portals at all in my world, um, and I'm going to show you how I can add them and quickly populate them. Like a lot of the hesitation with using rooms and portals in in Wise is just generally that people don't like authoring them. So we have uh, put some steps towards just taking the pain out of that process. Um, so I'm going to drag a spatial audio volume into my world here. Um, and then if we look in our details panel, I'll just uh, filter by fit here. Uh, so we got this fit to geometry section. Um, and now a little bit about how this works is if this is enabled, then it will fit as soon as you check the box or as soon as you move the actor. So I'm going to move it to an approximate location in my uh, test level here. And then I'm going to tick my box and then boom, it will automatically expand to the region that uh, sort of surrounds it. Um, it works by basically shooting rays uh, from the middle here to probe the, uh, the static mesh geometry around it. So uh, as a visualization, we have these little hit points, and that can sometimes guide your, uh, your placement. So as I drag the uh, spatial audio volume around with fit to geometry enabled, it's going to search for um, uh, static meshes in the world. Um, and what I can do to sort of speed up my 
authoring process is just hold Alt while I drag, and that's going to uh, create a copy. So uh, right away I've got two, and now oh, I, I just drag them both there. Um, so Alt drag, and it's going to fit to this other room. Now, as I explained, the, it fires rays from the, the middle here. So sometimes what's going to happen is you'll get um, one of these probes uh, exiting through a window like this. And this is clearly not the, the fit I'm looking for. So I can use my little filter, filter hit point slider here just to reduce the distance. Um, so that's going to uh, filter out the 95% shortest rays, if that makes any sense. So that, that can sometimes uh, just be a quick way to get it to fit properly. Um, so let's thing um, might have in your world is also geometry that's not aligned to your axis. I'm sure that's quite common. And if we just use the default settings and we hit fit, we get a box that it is aligned to the axis of the world. So we can switch the shape over to oriented box. And now it's going to search for an orientation. Um, sometimes it's useful to have it try to find the orientation for you, but if you know that your geometry is um, aligned to the axis, it's best to just leave that as oriented. Um, I just want to, I'm going to switch back to aligned here and show you how when we're outside and we don't have four walls, you can still use this to kind of um, fit between two or three walls, and it will attempt to automatically disable some of these surfaces. Now, obviously, this isn't a perfect box, so we're not going to get a perfect fit, but we might be able to uh, tweak it a little bit by changing the filter points. And then if that's not working to get the exact shape we want, hopefully it'll give us a good approximation and we can edit the uh, the geometry manually after that. So those are spatial audio volumes. Now, what about portals? Well, we have a similar feature for portals. Um, works very much the same way. Enable it, and then once you drag your portal, it's going to search for openings in the world to snap to. Just going to make this a little thinner here, and we can see that this is by again, drag. It will automatically uh, search for these openings and snap right in. Um, I'm just going to place a few more here just for for fun, just to show you how quickly I can author these portals. Be quite satisfying when it snaps right into place like that. So just a little detail here. What it what it's searching for um, is basically a door frame. So you need uh, you need parallel uh, surfaces on the top, bottom, and side to side. Um, you're not going to be able to fit if, say, you did, say you had a no roof. Um, it's not going to work. But in most scenarios where you have a, a nice door frame, it's going to work. Um, now, I'm sure what you're saying. Let's go back to spatial audio volumes. I'm sure what you're probably thinking is that my world is not full of box-shaped rooms, so how is this going to help me? 
Well, the good news is as long as your shape is convex, um, we should be able to still find a fit. In this case, um, we have this room that's kind of a L-shaped room. <laughs> um, and it actually works quite nicely. And then I can just do the usual alt drag and fit some of these other oddly shaped rooms in my house here. Um, if I just go back one step here, you'll notice that the, the roof is kind of a, a blue color and we've got this sort of turquoise color on the, the bottom. Uh, just drag this out so we can see here. I just disabled fit to geometry so it's not going to try and fit in this empty space here. But what it's gone ahead and done is assigned drywall to this uh, um, top section and tile to the, the bottom section, the floor here. Um, and how it's determined that is it's probed the physical materials of the mesh. Um, and in my project settings, I have those hooked up um, uh, in my integration settings. So I have a map here between the physical materials and my acoustic textures. And uh, as of uh, 21.1, wise, wise automatically syncs these with the authoring tool. Um, and if you have names that match up, then this map will automatically populate itself. So um, hopefully we've taken up some of the labor in assigning those acoustic textures as well. Um, yeah, so that's just kind of an overview of uh, fitting rooms and portals to geometry. Um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys and hear about how it's working in your levels and uh, if you're having any issues or if it's speeding up your workflow. But uh, for now, we're going to hand things over to Sean and he's going to talk about some of those other cool features that you saw in the video there. Okay, sorry, I uh, couldn't find the mute button, <laughs> but uh, we're good now. Okay, so it's a running thing. I, yeah, so I'm going to bring up Wise, so we're all set up. Okay, sorry about that delay. Um, just to show you what I'm showing here, tell you what I'm showing. I've got Wise on the right um, and Unreal on the left. Uh, I'll sort of minimize Wise for now. I'll come back to it later. So I'm showing the Wise Audio Lab. Um, the main map in the Wise Audio Lab. Uh, and so Nate's just given an explanation, obviously, of spatial audio volumes and acoustic portal actors, which can be placed directly in the level. Uh, to begin with, I'm going to give you an overview of like a, a parallel workflow, which is when you want to create custom blueprint classes and add spatial audio features to those blueprint classes, um, which wasn't entirely possible before because they weren't completely componentized, but now we've uh, either altered or created new components in Unreal uh, for adding spatial audio features. So if we look at the um, some of the spatial audio volumes to begin with in this map, 
um, just as a comparison. I'll zoom in here. We have this uh, building structure here, and we have various spatial audio volumes um, that are that represent the rooms within this building. Um, and also, we have similarly various portals um, that represent the, the doorways and windows and stuff. So uh, to demonstrate this blueprint approach, I've created a new blueprint class, and I've just recreated that structure from the level, but in a blueprint. And so um, uh, I'll just show you, um, it uses like the same visual meshes as the, the one from the level. But I'll, well, first of all, hide these meshes so you can see like the innards of the blueprint. Um, and inside, if you look at the, the middle floor here, um, I have three box collision components, which I'm using to, uh, I'll just zoom in here. Um, I'm using these box collision components to uh, represent the rooms, just like the spatial audio volumes in the, in the level. And each of these box collision components has an uh, AK room component, an AK geometry component, and an AK late reverb component attached to it. Uh, what I'm doing here when I attach these um, reverb geometry and room components is I'm basically uh, recreating the functionality of a spatial audio volume, uh, but I'm doing it in Blueprint. So uh, similarly, we have uh, the portals where we just have lots of box collision components and we've added portal components to them. So I'll just uh, unhide these meshes. Uh, so with that, I'll set up the cool thing about this workflow is that I can now just spawn that in my level, um, move it around, like spawn multiple of them. And it's all set up and ready to go from my blueprint. So that's a brief overview of like the blueprint workflow, which is now possible with this latest release. Um, so I'm going to use this Blueprint instance that I've just spawned to sort of segue into the next section, which is going to be about reverb and reverb aux bus assignment and reverb parameter estimation. Um, so if we look at this Blueprint instance that I have, um, I'll zoom in again on the uh, world outliner here. So I've, this is the Blueprint instance in my world. If I, if I look at its details panel, I can inspect the component hierarchy for that instance, just like I was showing you in the blueprint before. So if I click this late reverb component and look down at its uh, details panel, you can see that it's using this new feature, which is uh, auto assign aux bus. Um, and I, um, so right now it's being assigned house living room. Um, and that's because I have set up uh, decay keys in the Oxbus assignment map um, according to the size of these rooms. So as I mentioned in the video, um, the Ox auto Oxbus assignment works by estimating the reverb, the decay of your, the t decay of the reverb in your reverb environment and assigning an Oxbus. And you, you set up that decay to Oxbus mapping in your Unreal settings. The decay values are like upper bounds. So here, anything from 0 to 0 0.2 will give you host small room. Anything from 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 will give you host medium room, and so on. So um, if I play and... Uh, Hello! 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 Here, subtle difference between the reverb up here and the reverb down here. So um, the difference might be a bit subtle. So if you'll indulge me, I'm just going to get a bit silly. And I'm going to take my reverb, um, sorry, my blueprint instance, and duplicate it um, and bring it over here. Oh, actually, sorry, I've, uh, I've missed a step. Um, so I've just explained auto box bus assignment. I'm now going to go into reverb parameter estimation. Um, so we we saw that I I set up the re, the decay keys and they um, 
automatically populated my reverb aux buses. Um, but another thing we can do is we can use that decay value and directly map it to the reverb decay parameter um, instead of choosing an entire aux bus. And as well as that, we can also do the same thing for frequency dependent damping or HF damping and time to first reflection or pre-delay. Um, and that is controlled in the, again, in the integration settings via the RTPCs here. Um, so you can, you can assign RTPCs from your WISE project to these global RTPCs in your Unreal settings. Um, so I've, I've done that, so I'm just going to bring in WISE to sh show you. Um, so if I go to Game Syncs, I've got these uh, three new RTPCs that I've created. Um, and I've also created uh, um, a new aux bus. Sorry, yeah, a new aux bus with uh, a simple room verb effect on it. But I've mapped the parameters of that room verb effect to these. Uh, these RTPCs are driving those parameters. So that's the WISE setup. Um, now, if I go back to uh, the Unreal settings here, I can map those uh, RTPCs that I set up in WISE to these Unreal uh, slots. So let's put, sorry, uh, HF damping, um, decay is room decay, and time to first reflection is room pre-delay. So the last thing we have to do to, uh, to use this feature is in our um, Blueprint instance, we need to make sure that our reverb components are actually using this new um, dynamic room verb uh, aux bus. So one way to do that would be to um, just select each reverb um, uncheck auto assign and choose uh, dynamic room verb. But uh, there's a kind of quicker way to do that um, using Oxbus assignment again. Um, so with the auto assignment map, um, anything above the highest decay value will be given the default reverb Oxbus. And if there's no decay values, everything that uses auto assign will be given the default one. So if we set that to dynamic room verb, and go back to our um, Blueprint instance, the late reverb components now all have the dynamic room verb um, assigned to them. So uh, now with that set up, now I'm going to do the whole uh, duplication thing. But before that, I'll just play and let you hear what it sounds like. Uh, Using this approach. Hello! So again, some subtle differences in the reverb between each room. Um, the difference here is that they're all using the same aux bus, but the individual parameters are changing. Uh, and you can see that in the in Wise actually when I, if you look at this box. Um, when I move between rooms, there's a new decay to that time being assigned. Um, so now is when I was going to say uh, that might sound a bit subtle and it might not come across on the stream. So I'm going to duplicate this, uh, bring it across here. Um, I'll bring it all the way into the, the football pitch, soccer pitch, whatever you want to call it. Um, I'll scale it up to a ridiculous size and bring it back a bit and just move it down so I can walk inside it. So I've duplicated this Blueprint instance, um, increased the size and moved it over here. And it, the important thing here is that it's all of these rooms in this building and this building are all using the same aux bus. Um, so now if I, if I play and again start in the... Uh, So that's the reverb of the, the first floor in that building. Now walking in here. Hello. Let's go 
So you can hear that um, the reverb has been appropriately, the decay has been increased appropriately. Um, so there, that's basically all the features I wanted to get across. There's one last thing I'll go through quickly, um, which is, so the auto assign Oxbus and reverb parameter estimation, I demonstrated them in the context of a blueprint class, but they can just as well be used in spatial audio volumes. Um, so if I, uh, I'll use the uh, train station, one of the train station sort of um, rooms to demonstrate this. So here um, I have the this sort of train station building um, and it has the brick texture applied to all of the surfaces. So these these acoustic textures up until now have just been used for reflect for um, uh, controlling the parameters of the reflect plugin. But now you can use these acoustic textures to actually change the HF damping uh, this value of a reverb effect. Um, so I'm just going to move my player start um, somewhere close to that room. Um, uh, and I'll just make sure that, uh, so yeah, so I'm just making sure that that uh, spatial audio volume is using the dynamic room verb, which it is. Um, so now if I play, I've also added some drums using the Amen break uh, to, to uh, demonstrate this. But I just remembered that if I talk while I do this, it's, you're not going to hear anything. So I'll just explain it first. I'm going to play some a drum loop inside this big building walk inside it and then change the acoustic texture that's being applied to this spatial audio volume while it's playing to show you what that does to the HF damping. Um, so I'll do that now. Music. Um, if we change the uh, acoustic texture to uh, tile, so uh, that's just how the um, Acoustic textures can be used to change the HF damping. One last thing, uh, the you might see that the UI for this for assigning textures to a spatial audio volume has changed. Um, so we used to have a big list of material uh, of acoustic textures with numbers on on the in the level, but now we can we actually have this enable edit surfaces button, which allows us to if I just increase my speed. Uh, we can like choose individual faces um, and then change their acoustic texture. Uh, and yeah, we can do that for different value, uh, different parameters like the transmission loss or the en enable surface. Um, so now I have like different surfaces on each face. Or you can just override all of them at once. Um, and that is the end of the demo. I hope I didn't overrun for too long, <laughs> but um, I'm going to stop sharing now. No, I mean, a fantastic overview of those features. And uh, again, like just the creativity to arrive at this place with these uh, workflow speed ups and and again, seeing your process working between Unreal and Wise, uh, you both really uh, optimized those kind of workflows and uh, it's exciting like like Nate mentioned uh, you know people getting their hands on this working in these workflows uh, we're really excited to hear more about people and their use of these so uh, thanks so much for those overviews nice work
Thank uh, you. Congrats on uh, 2021.1. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Tali Kaklikian. And this is the transition to the next section of Spatial Audio Hotness. The hits will just keep on coming. <laughs> so let's roll with these next pieces of the presentation. Thanks so much. Welcome, Tali. Tali, another developer on our R&D team, uh, helping to make Spatial Audio great. Welcome. Are you staying muted on purpose? Come on. It's not me. <laughs> it wasn't me. It's part of the tradition. Right? It's me. It's me. It's my fault. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I I opened um, the cameras before the sound. And I was like, OK, I'm not hearing anything right now. Quick, 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 quick. <laughs> hey, it's audio. That's what we do. <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> And not not broadcasting, by the way. That's exactly. Uh, no. We're much better with the middleware side of things. Uh, so great. Great to have you, Tali. Thanks for joining in. And Nate will be fantastic to have your expertise during this next section. Uh, what are you going to show us today? So um, we're going to uh, go over some of the, uh, the SDK features in Spatial Audio now. Um, I mean, we're going to, I guess I'll share my screen here. Um, it's going to be, again, in the context of uh, Unreal, because what better way to demonstrate spatial audio? Um, all right, so uh, now I've got Unreal on the left and our trusty profiler on the right. Um, and here we are back in our uh, uh, spatial audio demo map. This is the unmodified version. Well, well, it's not unmodified, but it's closer to what you get out of the box. Um, and I'm just going to go ahead and trigger a sound here. And if we're looking in our 3D object viewer here, um, we're going to notice a few new things in WISE 2021. First, um, I'm going to just switch to wireframe mode. Um, but so now we're showing the direct path. This is the sound that I'm playing here. It's called large play large room AK component. And we see that this this direct path is going directly through the wall <laughs> and we're hearing it through wall transmission. Um, and that's what this 50% is telling us here that it's uh, um, applying an occlusion filter of 50%. And that's defined by the material on the wall. Uh, another thing that's immediately obvious is this giant cone here. And this is a, um, indicating the, the spatial spread um, that the listener is hearing. Um, let me just switch to our room tone here. Uh, so now I'm playing a room tone in this spun us around there. Uh, I'm playing a room tone in this large room here. And um, this is also going to transmit through the wall. Now, this is a, this is a brand new feature for um, 2021. And this little house icon is the, the virtual position of the room tone. And it's going to kind of follow me as I go circle around the room. Um, it's going to position itself like right at the edge of the room. And then, well, it's a very dim uh, spread cone. Uh, it's a little bit hard to see, probably. But um, what this is indicating is that the, the room transmission is coming from the entirety of the room. Um, 
in many cases, this contribution will be a lot lower compared to the contribution, say, coming from the portals, which is what we're seeing here. Um, but in certain scenarios, like if you have thin walls, that that's gonna that's gonna play a, an important part of your overall sound. Let's talk about those spread cones a little bit more. So. Portal spread is something that we've had in WISE for a while, um, but we refined it a little bit and made it uh, obvious in the 3D viewer, so you can really see what's going on. So again, I'm still playing the, the room tone, playing from this room, and it's uh, getting funneled through this portal here. And we can see how this spread cone automatically updates um, in accordance with the spatial, the geometry of the portal. Um, and as I transition through the portal, we get a wider spread. When I'm at exactly in the middle of the portal, well, I'm not quite there yet, but when I'm exactly in the middle of the portal, I'll get 50%. And then as I go into the room, we're gonna get uh, the spread is going to sort of envelop the listener and I'm going to start hearing it come from behind me until I'm entirely in the room and it's eventually going to fade uh, to 360 degrees or 100% spread. And that's not new, but um, we have this awesome visualization for it now and you can just, you can see exactly what's going on. Now, the next thing I want to show you guys, kill that room tone, is our new um, our new radial sound emitters. So now I've had sound coming from this little button here, and I've assigned a radius to this sound. Um, just quickly show you how to do that in Unreal. Um, so we've got button outside. Um, if I go to the um, the ambient sound actor, which is an AK component, um, I can search for radius, and we have uh, outer radius and an inner radius parameter. And when you set those on the AK component, you see these uh, yellow visualizations. Um, and I'm going to show you what that does. When I go ahead and play again, play my sound. And similarly, we get this visualization in the 3D viewer. And now I have this yellow spread cone that updates according to the sound's radius. Um, when I'm outside the sphere, the, the cone is exactly sort of pointing at the outer radius. When I um, start, just start penetrating the outer radius, my spread is going to uh, go towards 180 degrees, right about there. And then as I um, get closer to the inner sphere, it's going to interpolate linearly towards 360 degrees, at which point the sound will surround me entirely. Got this kind of vocal sample here, but my guess is this is something that would probably be more useful for ambient sounds, um, for say you have like a 5.1 or uh, ambisonics um, ambience, then you'll you'll get that you'll get those uh, the channels from your source file um, automatically um, mixed around the listener. And so. It, you might be thinking, okay, well, yeah, so what does that sphere do? It gives me a spread. Well, I could do that before, um, and you're absolutely right. Uh, in the attenuation editor, I can set a spread value here, 
uh, to custom and define my spread uh, with a curve. And once I've done that, I get a gray spread cone. And I the, the radius is uh, mostly useless now. And this is just to demonstrate that it's uh, basically just another way of doing this. Like you can, sure, you can define your spreads in, in the attenuation editor, you can, or you can define them geometrically using um, a radius. And it's really just up to you what you prefer. Now, if you are uh, using the, the radius, then you'll want to set this to none and so that my spread is driven by the sphere and not by the, the um, attenuation setting. And spread works with uh, diffraction and transmission as well. Um, when we go behind an obstacle, we see this, uh, these purple uh, diffraction cones and this blue transmission cone. We're getting 70% transmission through this uh, obstacle, which is defined geometrically. So what about portals now? Portals also define a spread. So spread from the source and a spread from the portal, how does that work? Well, it works uh, somewhat intuitively. Um, when the spread from the source is wider than the spread from the portal, then we get the spread from the source and the cone is drawn in yellow. And when I go further back, the spread value is limited by the aperture of the portal. So the, the cone turns green to indicate that it's, um, that the sound is kind of funneling through and can't go any wider than that portal opening. Um, this gives us a nice uh, visual representation. If we want uh, more details, we can flip to our um, advanced profiler. We can look at, look for the sound and we can see, okay, spread value is 14 so that's the spread if the portal wasn't there um, but it is in fact being channeled through this portal which has which has an aperture of 10. so the final spread value is going to be 10. the the aperture always kind of uh, wins out between the spread value and if that if that's confusing or you get uh, you know you forget what these values mean then I recommend you um, just open up the the help, and that's going to take you to the website and give you a, a quick overview of what these all these numbers mean. So it's a, always a convenient option and wise. So there's a quick introduction to our um, our radial emitters. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone over to Tally and she's going to show you how you can actually start using these uh, creatively in your game. Hey. Yes, so I'm going to show you a sneak peek of uh, the wall, the Wise Audio Lab. If you don't know already what it is, it's a game in Unreal, a sample game uh, that you can download right now. But uh, but right now it's not the 21 version. <laughs> Soon it's going to be. Let me present my screen. Okay, so if you don't know the, about the Wise Audio Lab, it's like an environment here, like with a island surrounded by water with some buildings and some fields and some sounds. Um, and we decided to update it for uh, 21.1 and also the spatial audio features that they just presented. So uh, the first thing we thought was uh, how we could use the radial emitters. So we, you saw you, the radial emitters are spheres and what you can do, we thought that spheres would be perfect if you wanted to uh, create an odd shaped cloud of these spheres to create like an environment with an ambient sound and all those spheres would emit this sound. So we thought that the ocean in the wall would be perfect for this. 
And um, that's what we did. I'm going to show you, but I'm just going to tell you how it was done before. So before, there was one game object that would follow the listener on this blind path here. And with attenuation curves and spread curves, it would make you feel like you're hearing the sound of uh, the ocean from everywhere. But those attenuation curves are only distance. Uh, they, 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 they are different with the distance with the listener. So if the listener was like here, you would hear, um, uh, we would have less spread and you would hear it from far away and the volume would be lower. And if you were closer, it would change. But then if you walk along the line, the coastline here, everything would be the same. The volume would be the same. The spread would be the same. But if we change this and use uh, radial emitters a little bit everywhere, it would be more uh, representative of uh, this environment. So I'm going to show you. Um, so if I play and I connect my game, uh, I can see uh, my environment in the Game Object 3D Viewer. So we can see all of these uh, radial emitters that I placed around. So what I did is I didn't have, I didn't add more than one. Oh, I didn't, I, I forgot to put some sounds here. <laughs> I don't know if you want to hear the sounds of the wall. <laughs> Tell me if you want me to. Um, so uh, you can see more than one radial emitter here, but it's only one game object. And what I did is I used the positions of the spline I showed you, and I set them all to set multiple positions because right now you can use multiple positions and spatial audio together. Yay! <laughs> So all of these is just one game object with multiple positions, and they are all, all have like their inner and outer radiuses, radii. I'm going to um, put uh, a focus on the lister. OK. Uh, and I'm going to remove this. OK. So you can see that if I go to this area at the corner, um, that the spread is more than 180 degrees because I'm surrounded by all of these uh, positions and I can hear the, the ocean from all of there. And if I go maybe a little bit more on the side, the spread is, gonna, is going to change. Like the, all of the additional, like ad, additions of the spread here. So I get like 180 degrees and it, it resembles more what it looks like in the environment. Um, and also what we did is we decided that this sound, ocean sound, should be diffraction and transmission enabled. So if I go more on this side here, you can see that the ocean sound that are coming from behind the train station uh, get diffracted and transmitted. So sometimes they get diffracted on here, for example, on the corner, on the different buildings, or if they don't find a path, they get transmitted and go through um, the room and the geometry. Here you can see that um, they have 100% uh, transmission loss, but you can put whatever you want. Um, and then you can, you might have seen that this area here also has uh, uh, like radial emitters. So we decided that the town ambience would be also a great example. I did the same thing. It's like a multi-positioned game object that I populated the town area with. And when you go inside of the the town, you, you will have like you'll be surrounded by this town sound always. And you'll also have the ocean sound getting diffracted and transmitted everywhere. So it's a little bit more mm, maybe immersive, if I would say. Uh, another thing we did in the wall now, I don't know why this thing is, is blinking. OK. Um, another thing we did is we replaced 
all of the trigger volumes for indoor ambiences. So we had like some indoor ambiences in uh, these buildings here uh, with rooms and portals. And since they already had rooms, we decided to use room tones instead of the trigger, uh, trigger uh, volumes. So uh, if I go, for example, near one of these buildings, you'll see I can, here it's, um, it's room tone from the wall here. We have this little house icon that we saw with Nate. And if I open the portal, you can see that it also will come from the portal. So like you can, you can have it from the portal and from the room. Like I have a lot of things right now, but with uh, the filtering, you can, you can have less things in your eyes. <laughs> I don't know if I have things here to add to the filters, but yeah. Um, so that's that's that, a little sneak peek of uh, the wall. Uh, it's gonna come in a couple of point releases. I don't know if there are questions, I didn't read them. Um, but yeah. Uh, so like fascinating to see on display the the wise 3d game object viewer all of the functionality in there to present what's happening at runtime in unreal um, the the new features coming to the wall uh, you know these are the kind of things that if you're just getting started with game audio you're just trying to understand interactivity uh, we make the the Wise Audio Lab and the Wise Adventure Game, our companion Unity pro project, uh, available to download through the Wise Launcher. And these uh, these include, you know, best practices like Tali, you've just shown uh, in the wall. Um, and we continue to evolve these. Uh, like you said, we started with. Uh, you know, sounds on a spline and vol trigger volumes to transition between rooms. And now we have evolved these concepts as WISE has continued to evolve. And this is the this is an access point for people to be able to to jump in and understand more about what's happening at runtime. And Nate, from from the presentation you gave just now about visualizing um, the different spread and um, you know aspects of rooms and portals uh, again unlocking the connection between what you author and wise and what's happening at runtime I think is a, a key part of of what we do here so thanks so much for bringing that yeah I think an important theme is kind of like having your sound emerge from the environment um, like I mean, Sean showed us how we can set up all these uh, settings before, and then you just edit your world, and then the reverb automatically uh, follows it. And similar theme with um, what Tally showed, like instead of using trigger volumes, we hook up room tones, and then all of a sudden our sound is uh, propagating through the environment in a natural way. Um, so that, you know, if the environment changes, the sound changes with it. So um, it might seem very technical and daunting, but hopefully that that cost is something you pay once up front. And then as you author every little uh, thing in your game, uh, the sound responds to it. Totally. Great. Well, uh, we have one more special guest joining us for this spatial audio cornucopia. And I just wanted to say, Thanks again to Nate and Tali for uh, the overview. And I'd like to welcome Christoph Tjarni for uh, the R&D team wrap up with our spatial audio CPU limit. Thanks. Thank you, bye. All right, All right. All right Christoph, good to see you today. Are you all set? Yeah, me too. All right. Yeah, I'm all set. Great. Go for it. So go for it. Yeah, so today uh, I'm going to talk about uh, 
I'll just one minute. I'm going to talk about the CPU consumption and the spatial audio. Uh, and as you might already know, uh, the computation of reflection and diffraction uh, is quite complex, and sometimes it, it, it can require a lot of CPU. So uh, at the moment, uh, you, you can uh, use uh, this parameter here, the number of primary rays, uh, to control the level of details uh, you want uh, in your uh, computation of reflection and, and diffraction. And the higher the value you set, uh, the higher the details you will have, but also uh, the higher the CPU you, you will consume. Uh, and uh, the problem with that is that uh, the CPU performance uh, for spatial radio is really related to the, uh, the number of emitters and the complexity of the geometry. Uh, and so that means uh, that if this parameter changes during the game, which is obviously the case, uh, you cannot use a fixed value uh, and have a good solution for like balancing your, your CPU on, on special audio. Uh, so that's why in the, the new version, we have added a, a new feature that's called uh, CPU limit. And basically, uh, uh, the CPU limit uh, lets you define uh, the percentage of CPU you want to allocate uh, to the computation of reflection and diffraction. Uh, so uh, let's say here, like you want to set uh, the percentage to 5%. So you want to allocate 5% uh, to uh, the computation of reflection and diffraction. Then the system uh, will uh, continuously adapt uh, the number of primary rays uh, for you uh, to maintain the CPU consumption uh, around uh, the value you set. Uh, it won't prevent all the spikes, so uh, uh, you, you need to think about the CPU unit more as a, as a compressor uh, than as a limiter, okay? Uh, and when, when you activate the CPU limit there, so when you set a value different than zero here, uh, then uh, this value that you set there, the number of primary, it becomes uh, uh, an upper limit. So meaning that uh, during the, the, the run, uh, the uh, CPU limit will not uh, uh, go beyond this limit, okay? So let's see an example on how it works. Uh, so I play here. Uh, and the first thing I, I want to show you, so if you pay attention to these two curves there, uh, uh, you see the first curve is the uh, special audio CPU consumption. And uh, the second curve here is the uh, number of primary rays, okay? And uh, at the moment, you can see that uh, the CPU is really low, and uh, the number of rays itself, it's at it's the max value we set in the, in the setting, okay? So I, I start like adding some stuff, and you'll see how this curve evolves. So let's see. If I'm going into the town, and now I'm uh, adding like uh, a new radio over there, okay. And now I'm moving around, and you see as I move, and as all this uh, this uh, part there I computed, you see the the CPU uh, is going higher. And as soon as the CPU is going higher, you see the, the number of primary rays that is automatically adapted to compensate. So it helps you like keep the value around the target you have set. Okay. So that's really important because uh, it, 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 it adapts automatically during the game. So you don't have to set a fixed value and so you Kind of, you are guaranteed that your CPU will stay in this range, okay? Uh, so that's what the system is doing. Um, and I want to show you uh, a little, uh, something else uh, that is not like uh, in this version, but it will be, it's a spoiler alert, it will be in the 21.1.1 version. And we, we added actually a bunch of like uh, monitoring lanes. Uh, Specifically for special audio, so you have a bunch of them there. And I'll show you one of them, uh, the special audio emitter process. And what this uh, new lens uh, allows you to, to do is to uh, better understand when you have like uh, 
uh, uh, CPU like going up or down, it, it helps you understand why actually. So if you look at the, this curve there, uh, where the CPU is going up, uh, you can see at the same time that you have here like the number of emitters going up. So it explains why uh, you get like this, uh, suddenly you get this drop in, in, in performance. Uh, uh, I mean, you, you get this drop on the, on the number of rays uh, to uh, actually uh, balance the, uh, the, uh, the uh, increase of CPU usage. Um, so yeah, so basically that's what I, I wanted to show you. So a way to take control of the, the, the CPU you want to use as for a special event. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Christoph. It's it's great to see the uh, you know the balance. I think as developers, we know that that we have to walk this line of performance and fidelity. So being able to expose that yeah. CPU limit, set that appropriately, uh, and then like everything in Wise, bring it back around to being able to profile and understand uh, you know some of the things that you're unlocking with these with these future features. Uh, and features available today is avail that ability to understand the complexity of spatial audio and bring that accessibility to it. Yeah, it's kind of it's trying to, we're trying to uh, abstract the complexity and just help people like uh, give us the, the the information when they they encounter the situation and we can help them debug or understand why and explain them all. This is why your CPU is going uh, uh, too high, uh, it, and and so we can help them like find solutions. Exactly, so it, exactly. It's going in the right direction for them. It's great work to be doing. I'm glad that uh, the team is focused on uh, bringing this level of accessibility for spatial audio. And uh, thanks for presenting those on those features today. Thank you. All right. Take care. Bye. -bye. Yeah. You too. Bye. So here we go. Uh, we are wrapping up the first half of day two. If you're following along at home, we went through and talked to the folks from Wise Automotive uh, and then got a, a, a huge overview of the spatial audio offerings in Wise 21.1. Uh, thanks to the spatial audio team and the innovation automotive team for, uh, for bringing those presentations to us. Uh, uh, during the first half. Moving forward, uh, after a short break here, we will be jumping into the Unity integration, talking about addressables and WAPI in Unity. Uh, if you don't know what that acronym means, tune in here in a bit and we'll unlock that for you. Uh, we're gonna talk about staying up to date with WISE, registering your project and evaluating plugins. Uh, and then we've got a whole suite of educational certification and team training information to, to lend you as a resource as you find your way with WISE or continue to build skills. Uh, and so with that, we're gonna take a short break uh, and, and come back for the second half. Uh, I think we're gonna pause on uh, so, Discord, how many folks have questions coming out of the first half of today? We have a short time for this break. It's going to be about 10 minutes. Uh, but if you would like, we'll drop the Discord server link into the chat. And you can jump over there and have a chat with uh, folks from Spatial Audio, folks from the automotive team uh, for this short period of time. Uh, and we're hanging out over there. Um, feel free to ask us any questions and then circle back if you can for the second half of day two. Again, we will be unlocking that Discord uh, server for the end of the day and we'll be staffing that to answer questions that you might have uh, across all the feature areas uh, presented during day two here. So with that, I hope you all are doing well. Uh, hang in there. We're having a good time, and it's great to have uh, the folks behind the features here at Audio Kinetic bringing this depth of experience to you. And I hope to see you in a few minutes. Uh, take care.
All right. Welcome back for the second half of day two here at the WISE Worldwide Online Expo. 2021 edition, did last year even happen? We cannot answer that question for you, only you can. But here we are today and we're happy to be here sharing all of the new and exciting features of WISE 2021.1 with you. And we got a cool afternoon set up for you, talking Unity addressables, uh, WAPI in Unity, staying up to date with WISE, registering your project and evaluating a plugin, education and certification resources, as well as team training. Uh, and we're gonna wrap it all up at the end of today with a uh, Q&A on our Discord server. We'll drop the link in the chat. You can round up with us uh, in feature specific rooms uh, where you can discuss with the developers questions that you might have from today's presentations. So definitely stick around uh, for that. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. It's always a pleasure to, to get it from your perspective. So as part of this, um, I want to say thanks up front. So with that, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Benoit Santar and Etienne Richan. Welcome to the live stream. Hi, hey, everybody. Cool. Integrations team representing. Uh, I'm going to hand it off to you for today's presentations, and thanks uh, for being here. All right, Ben, so you want to open things up? Yep. Uh, so first, a uh, big ticket feature for 21.1 in integrations was uh, Unity addressable support. Um, can we just see those slides, yeah. please? <laughs> Absolutely. This is the... Yep. All right. So the first question could be, why did we decide to support addressables now? Uh, well, from for, for veterans that are used to using WISE, um, typical media management can start to feel a bit outdated. Uh, it was invented back when games were on CD-ROMs, and it was a good idea to have all your contiguous, all your media contiguous to your levels and all that for your game. And so the idea of uh, monolithic sound banks uh, was used. Uh, but now we're starting to see that manually assigning your things to to your sound banks is uh, starting to be tedious, especially with games that have more and more content, um, and also large sound banks, large binary files don't play very well with uh, iterative content like uh, DLC or seasons in episodic games and whatnot. Uh, so we decided to revisit uh, all of that. Um, the logical step in in dusting out this, this media management problem uh, was to leverage the game engines that already exist. Uh, both Unity, Unreal, in-house engines, they all have asset dependency systems uh, that we could tap into to to um, just sort of so that we feel more integrated into the engine of your choice. Uh, so right now, having monolithic binary sound banks on disk is kind of a parallel pipeline for your audio. Uh, you need to tweak your packaging settings in your engine to tell it to not forget uh, to package your sound banks. In Unity, you have to use the magical streaming assets folder. Uh, so it's always a bit wonky and not it doesn't feel fully integrated into the, the engine's asset pipeline. So our first goal is to really eliminate that parallel universe and just use what the engines already have. Um, and in Unity, uh, they've introduced addressables as an experimental feature a few years ago now and uh, we've decided to just tap into that to to manage our media. So um, what we did in 2021.1 in the Unity integration is the first step towards having better media management. So as Etienne will will present in his presentation, um, you it is not the silver bullet we we aim for in 21.1. It's the first iterative step where uh, Basically, we make the sound banks recognized by the asset pipeline uh, and then hand it off to Unity to package everything. So um, without further ado, Etienne, show us addressables. 
All right. Uh, thanks, Ben. Um, yeah, so I'd like to open things up just by sort of going with a brief overview of what the uni integration entails right now. Um, so sort of your, what are the main parts of this? So one of the first things you're working with in the integration is the wise picker, uh, which lets you see your wise object hierarchy uh, inside of your Unity project. And then you're, you're drag and dropping your objects from this picker onto your game objects to create wise components to handle uh, whatever audio logic you want to happen in your game. Uh, we also provide uh, API wrappers so that you can um, control the sound engine directly if that's more your style of thing. And then another important part of the integration is that we package wise assets into your game. So as Benoit mentioned, we copy these files into streaming assets when you build your game based on which platform you're building for. We'll also package uh, the platform specific binaries uh, that your different plugins might need. Um, yeah, so the build system is integrated in the Unity integration. And finally, uh, we provide a WAPI client, which lets you uh, communicate with wise authoring using this wondrous API that I hope you're all familiar with. So, what does the addressables package actually address? Um, basically, it uh, changes the AK Bank component so that um, it, it interacts with addressables. And it um, is a major overhaul of how we're doing our asset packaging. So we're no longer copying these files into this folder so that the Wise Engine can find them and load them. We're letting addressables and Unity load the, the media and uh, sound banks into memory and then pass them to Wise. So um, brief overview of what is an addressable asset. So this addressables package is a package you add on to your Unity project. It's not built in. Um, so if you're not familiar with it, I would recommend taking some time to familiarize with the you know, baseline system before diving into our, uh, our implementation of it. So uh, fundamentally, once you have this package, basically all of your assets have a checkbox that lets you mark them as addressable. And um, that lets you use uh, a concept called an asset reference. Um, in your um, components or scene objects to um, reference these addressable assets without um, kind of hard linking them. So normally, if you reference it to another asset in a component, well, when you package your scene that contains that component, uh, everything it references gets bundled into it, into an asset bundle. But with addressables, it lets you kind of uh, segment, you know, keep some things in one asset bundle and then your addressable assets in different asset bundles. So seeing as these assets are in different bundles, the addressable system is used to load assets from these bundles dynamically and uh, asynchronously, which is something important to consider. Um, addressables has this concept of groups, which uh, sort of uh, when you build them become different asset bundles. And then these asset bundles can be delivered uh, via content delivery network. So this allows you to do things like remote hosting of your game assets, publish game updates and publish DLC. So going over these concepts, once again, just to make sure that uh, we're all talking the same language, in addressables, you have groups, which uh, resolve to asset bundles when you build your addressables. Um, so those groups basically define what assets go where. And then you have schemas, which sort of tell Unity where do these bundles go and how does it deal with work with them. And then you have build scripts um, because there's uh, once you're working with addressables, there's two build steps. There's the steps where you the step where you build addressables, and then the step where you package your player. Um, and these build strings scripts basically let you do things um, before and while you're building your asset bundles. And finally, an important concept to to consider is the catalog that addressables uses, which basically um, is the map that your player is going to use to go from an asset reference, which is kind of like a, a path. It's normally just a unique string identifying your asset to find the correct asset bundle and then locate it either on a remote server or on your, in your local files. So quick sip of water. What does the wise addressables package entail? So first of all, it's a GitHub package. Um, that extends the integration. Um, so it requires that you have already integrated uh, WISE into your Unity project, and it has to be the 2021 integration or later. 
Uh, this is because there's a, essentially uh, parts of the integration code that are defined in or out based on the presence of this package or not. Um, we also provide a demo package on the GitHub and documentation in our Unity um, integration documentation. There's also a tutorial there, uh, which you can use with this demo package uh, to follow a series of steps to get set up with Wise Addressables, um, try you know, delivering a scene with Addressables, try delivering just a prefab and making changes, getting your local hosting set up. So um, you could technically use this as your first introduction to Addressables, but it's quite uh, the system to wrap your head around. So I always recommend consulting the official resources as well. Now, what does the Addressables package do? Um, first of all, it'll import our bank and media files, which are .bnk and .wem files, as Unity assets into the project. Um, so once they're Unity assets, you know you can check that checkbox and use them with addressables. Um, and then uh, the second step of this import is we automatically add the assets to addressables groups based on what platform they were generated for. And um, now sound banks are all loaded via the addressable system. Um, so there's no more telling uh, wise where to look for these bank files. We're saying, here's the memory. And finally, uh, we provide a custom build script, which I'll talk about a bit later, but basically um, lets you sort of build only platform specific bundles for wise, if that's something you want to do. And uh, finally, before we actually get into the more technical details, um, I want to address the question, why is it experimental? So, I mean, the first reason is that, uh, you know, while we're confident in this and we, we've tested it on our projects like the WISE Adventure Game and, um, you know, the different things we use for internal testing, uh, we haven't, we don't have yet have, have feedback from, you know, teams who have used this in a large, very large scale project. Um, there are also some features that um, are not yet supported. Um, so prepared events, external sources, and uh, encoding and decoding sound banks are not things that are currently implemented, um, but you know are sure to come down the pipeline. And yeah, and the main reason that I think it's experimental is that uh, we want to be flexible with it. Uh, you know, if the feed, if we get a lot of feedback about certain features, you don't like the way that the groups are being created. You know, we want to be able to make some serious changes and have that be expected by our clients, that we want to make this work as well as possible for the, the most workflows. Um, so yeah, uh, we want your feedback. Please share it um, You know, if you're having problems with support or on the community Q&A. And we really, really want to make this as useful as possible for everyone. Great, so moving on, I'm just going to cover brief, based briefly how we used to load banks, um, how they're loaded now, and how streaming media is handled as well with uh, this addressables paradigm. So you might be, uh, you know, in in the uh, vanilla uh, Unity integration, in your scene, you probably have a game object uh, which contains an AK bank, bank component, uh, which is what you use to to load banks in your scene. You have some triggers on it, which will load or unload the bank uh, depending on certain conditions. And um, if so basically, what is inside that AK bank is what we call a wise object reference, which essentially just stores the bank name. So when you load that component, when the load bank method is called, um, we tell wise, hey, load a bank with this name. And wise is aware that its uh, media files and, and bank data are located in the streaming assets folder. So it'll go and load that into memory on its own. And then if you have streaming media, well, it'll find the WEM file and stream it from disk. So with addressables, we have a couple extra layers to this uh, Russian doll <laughs> that I created to illustrate this. So once again, we have a scene. We've got a game object on it. Um, it's got an AK bank component, which under the hood is using a wise object reference to keep track of the bank. And now uh, that object reference is storing a wise addressable bank, um, which is this new asset we create when we import the banks. And this addressable bank, which is going to be packaged with your scene, contains asset references to the addressable actual data of uh, the bank and the media that the bank uses. So when you call bank, load bank, excuse me, um, addressables will fetch that asset bundle and load the data from it. So if, if you can imagine that you have a, a scene that's packaged into your game by default, 
um, you know, your default asset bundle is going to contain all of these things. Oops, there we go. The all of these things, and then all your different asset bundles for your different banks are going to be in uh, different um, asset bundles. Simple as that. And then we fetch them with addressables. Great. So drilling down into what actually happens with a load bank. So in the addressables package, there's a new bank manager, which is what handles the loading and fetching with addressables. So you call load bank on your component. Um, the addressables bank manager will tell addressables, you know, I need to load this asset. Um, and then at this point, things become asynchronous because the addressables API is async. Um, so addressables will check its catalog, see if the bundle is currently downloaded onto the user's computer. If it has to, it'll download the bundle. The bundle is then loaded into memory to a certain extent, and then the asset is loaded from the bundle. And then at this point, we can take that data and pass it to WISE via a memory copy. And we use a memory copy, while slightly less efficient, it basically lets us free up all the memory in Unity and unload that asset bundle if there's nothing else being referenced in it. Um, so then all the memory management is handled by WISE and you don't get stuck with things kind of trying to keep track of uh, where that was loaded. Um, yeah, and then for loading streaming media, um, this at the moment, uh, as the person who did it, I would say it's less than ideal, but uh, you know, there's some simple changes that we plan on making that will make this more ideal. So once a bank asset is loaded, we also check the list of media assets uh, in that uh, addressable bank um, object. And then we'll, we'll go fetch those media assets from the asset bundle and then check if uh, they're already present in the games persistent data folder. So we basically have a hash that we, check, that we compare to make sure that the media hasn't changed since the last time you fetched the asset bundle. Um, if the media has changed or it's not there, then we'll write that asset from memory into the persistent data folder. And wise, when you're playing streaming media, it will go and fetch, uh, that, read that data off the, off the disk. And then once all that's done, we release the asset so the asset bundle can be unloaded. Um, so in the short term, um, ideally, we, we don't want to have to load that asset bundle just to see if we've already got the file or not. We might want to check that a bit more um, ahead of time with just the file hash. And in the long term, uh, obviously, we'd just like to be able to have WISE directly read the streaming media data from the asset bundle. But that's a longer term objective because um, there's different ways you can compress your asset bundles and you know it's a bit of a trickier task. Great, um, so at this point, I'd like to move on to a demo uh, where what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna install the WISE addressables package into the WISE adventure game that we all know and love. I'm gonna take a look at the new assets that have been created. We're gonna take a look at the default groups that have been created for these assets. And we're also gonna take a peek at you know, where these WEM files have been extracted so that they can be played. So uh, let me switch over to Unity and I'll put that full screen for now. So uh, this is the WAG, I'm in the main scene. And at the moment, I don't have addressables installed. I don't have the addressables package. So in order to go get that, I find the correct tab. Um, so we have an audio kinetic GitHub and we have uh, this wise Unity addressables package, which is available up there. You can clone it, you can tweak it, you know, you can give us feedback on it. Um, however, the, the readme is a bit sparse because we want people to be reading the official documentation. And in this documentation, there's a very uh, extensive overview of getting set up um, you know, in the WISE demo game, building the project, and then we have a tutorial with an example of how you might want to package DLC and then uh, deliver it uh, with a local hosting setup. Yeah, so uh, I want to install this. So uh, Unity has a, a handy feature where in the package manager, we can add a package directly from the Git URL. So that lets us kind of like pull things automatically. You might want to, um, you know, clone this if you plan on, on making some changes to the source code uh, and then and then add the package uh, from your disk. So now we just get to wait a little while, <laughs> an indeterminate amount of time as uh, the package gets imported to take uh, less than a minute. 
Um, and I just have to make sure that at some point it's going to do domain load reload. And uh, I'm going to have to click on something in Visual Studio. So we've imported all that stuff. Domain reload here. Great. All right, solutions being prepared. And there's the thing. All right, now we can work in Wise. So the pa the package is installed. The code files are here. It's, it's not a ton of code. You can you can go through this pretty quickly. Um, yeah. So now my package is installed. Uh, we uh, we list the Unity addressables package as a dependency, so that will automatically get installed as well to your project. And um, so the first thing that we need to do once it's installed is import our sound banks. So in order to do that, we go into our, our project settings, and then we get to choose where we want our sound banks to be generated. So if I were to open my WISE project right now, you'd see that in the settings, uh, my sound banks are set to be generated in you know, a generated sound banks folder that's outside of my Unity project. Now that these need to be imported, uh, they have to be within the assets folder. So basically, the main, the only constraint is that you choose a folder within uh, assets, and then you can name it whatever you want. I'm going to name this uh, Wise Data. Okay, and then um, if if you're kind of coming from a vanilla project, you it might automatically copy the the files in your generated sound banks already. So the import step is going to be automated. In my case, I'm going to uh, regenerate my sound banks. And here's a, a quick peek at the WAPI picker while that happens. Right, so the, the assets have been generated. And because they were created in the assets folder, Unity is going to import them into the project. So um, you can take a look at the in the editor files. You can look at how our custom asset exporters are, what they're actually doing. But in summary, uh, they're creating an asset for each bank and each media file. And then it's uh, creating an addressable bank, which basically continues the mapping for each platform to specific bank and media files. And it's what's used uh, by the component to, to fetch the correct bank. Um, and it's also, the second thing it's doing is it's creating addressables groups for each platform and adding these assets to them. So we'll just uh, let that finish. All right, so we're almost done there. Progress bars, am I right? Yeah, at least there's a progress bar, you know? <laughs> Uh, the challenge of our generation. Mm. The truth in so, progress yeah. bars. You're doing great. Thanks. You know, this is the, you're going to have to wait a bit the first time you do this, but afterwards, you know, it's incremental because your assets are already there. So it's only new assets that you generate that are going to have to get imported. Um, any minute now, we should be up and running. There we go. Second iteration. Why not? OK, so if I take a peek at my WISE data folder, I've got a folder for each platform, which contains um, these assets for my media and banks, the bank file and the web file. And I just renamed that. That's dangerous. Anyway, and then uh, in, in the WISE data folder, we have these sort of meta addressable sound banks. So say we look at uh, the desert sound bank. So we, there's two things there to look at. So there's the data platform list, uh, which is basically uh, you know each platform is going to have a different set of banks and media, obviously. So that's where we keep track of those. And then when you build your game, we sort of discard this part of the asset, and we only keep the current platform assets, which is uh, a mapping of basically localization languages um, 
in this uh, implementation, we consider SFX to be its own localization, uh, which you may or may not have a problem with, but it lets us you know, just have a list of you know, SFX and then your languages. And then here are the banks and media for those different uh, localized, different types of sound assets. So I'm on platform windows. So this is a asset reference to my desert sound bank. And likewise, this is an asset reference to my media. Um, and so just to, to reiterate on that uh, little nested doll I was showing you before. So I have a component that's an AK bank. I've chosen the desert bank in this case. Um, that desert bank resolves to uh, what we have in the resources or scriptable objects folder here, a scriptable object of a sound bank, which we have a wise, it's called a wise bank reference. I managed to find that on the first try. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, they don't have the actual name. So this bank reference is going to be packaged with the whatever object is referencing it. And it also directly references the addressable sound bank for desert. So this asset is also directly pa packaged with your object. But when this is loaded, um, these assets are what are going to be fetched um, asynchronously and from wherever they may be with addressables. So um, that's the overview of the assets we've created. It's not a, there's like three types of assets. And uh, now we can look at our uh, bank, our, sorry, our groups. So the asset management window addressable groups. Here we can see that there's a, two groups for each platform. So we have the Windows group, um, YSATA Windows, which contains all of the banks, all of the media for that platform, and the Windows init bank group. So by default, we separate the init bank out because, um, yeah, uh, if, you're, if you have sort of a sequential uh, you know, delivery process in mind, odds are that you're gonna to need to update the init bank. Um, and it just makes sense for it to be in its own group so that you can fetch that small asset bundle quickly when it needs to be updated. And you know, there's nothing else that needs to be loaded because that's the first thing you're gonna fetch and load. So you want it to be fast. Um, quick aside, in order to load the init bank, we have this sort of new component uh, that we put wherever you put your AK initializer. So, Normally it's created by default, but sometimes you might have to create it by hand depending on your other settings in your project. It's called the init bank holder. You just point it to your, your init addressable sound bank. And that basically lets the bank manager go and fetch it with addressables when it's initializing. So um, obviously I feel a lot of uh, you folks will likely wanna have something a bit more granular than this. So obviously you can start creating, you know, your different groups for your different um, types of banks. So I can create a, a group for for my wise data. Oops, that's not an underscore. Uh, Windows DLC. Right. And then I can go find my, my DLC bank wherever it is um, and then move it into that group. I might have to move some media in there. And that way, you know, my my addressable groups are getting more and more granular. You know, I'm going to be able to fetch smaller files. Um, and just get the things that I need. Um, so you might've noticed that I've got a very specific naming convention here. This is for our custom build script. So in order to set that up, you basically, uh, you wanna go into your uh, addressable settings. Um, so they have sort of their default build scripts in this data builders folder, which is created automatically. And then you can create uh, to, to, to the wise build script. And then you go into your addressable settings and add that bad boy in there. And that means basically when I build my addressable groups, which is the step that takes all of my addressable groups and creates asset bundles with them, I can choose the wise build script. What the wise build script does, it's pretty simple. It checks uh, the name of your asset bundle. If it starts with wise data, it'll look a bit deeper. If it doesn't, it'll ignore it. And then it'll check the current build plat tar platform that you're targeting. If that platform matches, uh, is matched in the name of the, of the group, well then 
uh, we include it because there's a setting here called include and build that you can toggle on or off. So uh, when I run this um, and build my addressable groups, save the scene. Do, do, do. Just give it a second, it's building a couple, couple groups. Right, um, we can see that while uh, my Windows, uh, say DLC, has been built, the Mac in it bank has been unchecked. So, you know, if you just want to build everything all the time, use your own build scripts, but we thought this might be useful for some people. And it also gives you a bit of an example of how you can create custom build scripts uh, to work with addressables. Um, yeah, so now that that's done, I've built my, um, I've built my uh, groups, excuse me. I've set up my init bank holder. I can actually just run my game, go into my main scene, and uh, the, the chain should have worked. So uh, let's go in here. So I don't know if you guys can hear this, but I can. I'm swinging my blade. I've got sound. And uh, we've got a bit of a still a little bit of uh, debug logging going, just, you know, because you're probably going to hit some uh, minor issues uh, the first time you try and package things. So we let you know when the bank actually gets loaded and if it had a valid ba bank ID. So you, you know, you might want to comment those out once you're familiar with the system, but this is a good way of keeping track that your banks are actually getting loaded by the system uh, the way they're intended to. Um, yeah, so the last thing I wanted to show you uh, for this addressables demo is um, when I uh, changed my WISE settings uh, to generate sound banks in WISE data, it automatically uh, do, 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 it automatically changed uh, the XML file, well, the, the project file for this. So your project gets reloaded if it's open, obviously. And if I look in here, uh, the target for my generated sound banks is now inside of my assets folder. So that's how we handle that. Um, and that's the one thing when you're uninstalling this package, if you want to revert, then you're going to want to uh, change this back manually. Yeah, and the, the last, last thing I wanted to show you is where my uh, media actually ends up. So when I play the game, uh, we load the sound banks and we unpack the streaming media files. Uh, so they end up in your, uh, you know, your local uh, Unity games persistent data folder. So here we've got all these web files and their hashes for comparison. So yeah, um, heading back to the presentation, um, to wrap things up, things to keep in mind, your sound banks are loaded asynchronously, which means that events are gonna be delayed until the sound bank is loaded. Um, so if you're, <laughs> the first time you're loading the bank is when you're gonna be fetching that data remotely, you might expect a certain delay if you're trying to fire events immediately. Another thing to watch out with addressables mm -hmm. is assets that are referenced in a scene are packaged with that scene. So the addressables system lets you um, lets that not happen. But if you try and like link these bank uh, assets directly in your scene, well, they're going to be packaged in there. And finally, uh, you know, uh, this is more general knowledge, but addressables is not meant for updating code, only assets. So you're not going to be able to like switch to using addressables on a ship game without having to you know rebuild your player and ship that to to your to your users. So uh, with that, um, if you have questions, uh, because we're covering a lot of stuff, I think we, it'd be better to save them for the Discord breakout room, unless Damien or Benoit, there's something that's popped up to you right now. Great. Uh, thanks, Damien. So uh, moving on, take another quick sip of water. Our next presenter, me. WAPI and Unity. So, um, what uh, what is WAPI and Unity? How do you, if you're already using this, uh, what's what's changed? And if you want to use this, uh, uh, get excited because um, it's never been a better time to start doing so. So, uh, what have we changed in 2021 to the integration that affects WAPI and Unity? So, first of all, uh, we've um, sort of overhauled the wise picker so that it now has two modes. It's got the sort of legacy mode and the WAPI mode where it'll communicate directly with wise authoring. Um, and to a certain extent, this affects game logic components because the picker in your components can also be in legacy or WAPI mode. And finally, we've sort of 
completely redone the WAPI, WAPI client wrapper um, so that um, a lot more of the behind the scenes stuff is handled and you just have an interface that you know you with more friendly calls. Um, so it can be used more easily and uh, so there's no less chance of there being interference between the things you're trying to do. So uh, briefly covering the picker modes. Um, so in file system mode, uh, it's the same as same as always. Uh, basically, what it does is it parses the work unit files on your on your disk and populates the hierarchy from there. Whenever you save the project, your your work units get updated. They get reparsed, and your picker uh, displays those changes. Um, so the functionality in the picker is pretty much limited to component creation. You can drag and drop your objects from the picker onto a game object and get that component. Um, with wise authoring mode. Um, it now uses WAPI to communicate directly with your open authoring project. So obviously you need to have WISE open alongside your Unity project uh, for this to work. And um, once that connection has been established, whenever you make changes to your project, those will be immediately reflected in the picker via a subscriber system. And there's some extra new features, like you can sync your selection between the two, you can trigger events, you can stop all your events, uh, you can rename and delete um, objects from within Unity. And uh, you can you know, open the folder. And there's this find references in scene, which doesn't really use uh, WAPI, but uh, it's a new feature that we've added to the picture that I think you might find handy. So um, I think I'm just going to go to the demo right now, because we're, we're right in it. So if I take a look at this wise picker, we'll see here I've got this. Um, these two modes, and right now I'm connected, but I can't actually uh, update my picker because in WISE, I've got a modal window open. So if, like, if I close that up, this error message goes away, and lo and behold, my uh, picker is populated with all the uh, assets in my game. So I've got auto sync selection uh, checked. So if I select this campfire, it's selected in the Project Explorer, and vice versa, I can select things in my Project Explorer, and boom, I'm selecting them in my picker. Uh, if I uncheck this, that's where this um, little uh, Find in Project Explorer comes into handy, because I can sort of look around my picker, and then, OK, this is what I want, and then find it in the Project Explorer, and then it, it selects it in there. So other things I can do is I can um, rename this asset, uh, whatever it's called there. It gets updated in WAPI. Uh, I can actually delete it, and it gets deleted there. And here's the test one of truth. I can undo that, and hey, it it came back. So you know, it's it's more responsive. You don't have to save your project every time, but you have to be sure that you save your cha your changes at the end of the day uh, before you generate your sound banks. Um, yeah, so that's most of the features. Um, I can I should have stopped that a while ago because you guys can hear that little music. Um, it's a groovy loop, yes. though. Etienne, uh, a little, and... little loop, but a bit, a bit repetitive. Yeah, perhaps. but uh, well, no offense, Matt. We're idling. We're <laughs> idling, right? And, yeah, exactly. Uh, so. so thanks so much for the overview. Again, I'm, I'm not quite done there, uh, Damien. I'll I've put still you got back. a couple, couple of tricks up my sleeve. You're almost there. I'm so excited to hear the end of this presentation. All right. So, so that was uh, the wise picker. Uh, there's some neat extra little features we've added now. So say, for example, I've got this a desert bank here. Uh, I can now right click the component and find it in the wise picker uh, from the context menu there, which I think can be useful for uh, some people. I can also do the same thing where I, I right click my wise object here and find references in the scene, which is basically just going to um, update the search bar and find uh, the reference to my scriptable object. So now I can find this bank. So it, it, uh, hopefully this sort of cyclical, you know, I can find the component here from my scene and then go to my picker, then find something else, uh, will improve the quality of life of people working with Unity. And let me just clear that little red thing because, you know, sometimes you get errors, but so far it fails gracefully. Um, and, you know, you're not gonna, you know, the, this is all still working fine. Um, yeah, so the last thing I wanted to demonstrate uh, with WAPI is uh, a little bit of a demo um, where on how to uh, you know build your own WAPI components because 
this picker is using this uh, class we call the, y the WAPI utilities to make all of its calls to WISE authoring. And basically everything else you want to do with WAPI should also go through this, these utilities. So quickly in the slide, we have the WAPI utilities and the WAPI helper. And basically this handles all of the asynchronous nature of uh, WebSocket communication and provides helper functions to uh, send your WAPI commands and uh, you know, receive that data and parse it. Um, so in this case, I've created a, a little custom component here that I call the sound volume slider. And um, what it does is it's got a search bar here uh, that I can use to, uh, that is using a WAPI WACL call, which if you're not familiar with WACL, take a look at Bernard's presentation, get familiar, it's super powerful, it's super handy, to search through uh, the WISE project and return all of the uh, sounds that match this name. So I just want the ambient desert. Uh, maybe we'll just get the short ones. Okay, so I've got these two elements. And if I open this up and then I find it in here, uh, Ambient Desert Day Short. Um, basically, when I move this slider, it's going to update the volume on that sound. So I'm using another WAPI command to set the volume on my uh, WISE object. And very briefly, I'm just going to show you the code. Um, you know. I just want to, you know, you don't have to understand everything, but I think it's it's quite straightforward and it's worthwhile to, you know, show you guys how easy it is to get set up with this. So basically, I have a one one file uh, component here, um, and I want what I want to do is I want to set a property uh, via WAPI. So what I've done is I've opened up the WAPI documentation. I've looked for this set property command. And then uh, take a look at what are the actual values that I need to send uh, via WAPI to get this to work. And there's even an example here. So it expects a JSON object that looks something like this, an object ID, the name of the property, an optional platform, and the value to set it to. So on my end, I've created this uh, class that is going to become my JSON object. So this ours class is something that's in the helper file, and it's basically just this abstract class that has an implicit conversion to a string. So pass this to the WAPI function, it becomes a, a JSON string, which is used uh, to, to communicate. Um, so yeah, I just set its values and then send that. And then my actual component, I've got my volume slider, I've got my, my, my filter, my search filter, and I've got a list of names and GUIDs. So my first, the first part of that was, uh, sorry about that. Let's go there and there was searching for a component. So, right, let's find something. So basically whenever I change the text in there, I build a WACL query, which is just another thing in the helper. Uh, and this is the string that I'm passing it. Take a look at the WACL documentation. Uh, it's a super simple sort of database style um, search language. And then query language, I mean. And then I, I set my return options, which are, you know, what what do I want this uh, return? What do I need for my return? So I just need an ID and a name. So I tell it, give me the results of this search and give me uh, these properties of the objects. I create a callback and then I use the web utilities function to send that uh, command. And my callback is a simple function that's just taking uh, this list of items that I've that I've received, and putting in, them into the list of names and the list of GUIDs. So the list of names I'm displaying here, and then uh, the last part of this component, almost done here, is that I can set the volume on all of these objects using a different command, which uses my very straightforward set property object. And then I just say set property for each of these GUIDs, set the volume to this new volume value. And that's it. I've got some basically boilerplate code for the inspector, which lets me you know, call these functions when I make changes. But like all of the actual WAPI, all the WAPI code I needed to learn and understand was like this function, um, you know, knowing what to do with my return, building a WACL string, and then, you know, checking the documentation and and building the the command that I want to send. 
Uh, yeah, and it lets me do this, I think, quite powerful thing, which is I could, you know, search for a hundred elements and then set all their volumes to something else. Uh, maybe you don't want to control the volume, but there's all sorts of properties you control, and I think uh, there's a lot of really interesting tools that people can build um, with this new exposure of the uh, WAP API. So now I'm done. Um, Take your questions to the breakout room. We'll be there this afternoon. Awesome. Take it away, Damien. Etienne, thank you so much for giving that overview. And I know that uh, you know wise users out there using the Unity integration, you know, from the accessibility of these new WAPI features that you're just showing off, uh, brings you know wise directly into Unity. Uh, all the way down to that engine level addressables and the management of resources. Now, not every wise author is going to be handling that, but every game is gonna to have to handle the management of their assets in some way. And so whether it's the, the wise uh, artist or author who's doing it, or if you're working as a wise author with your developer to set these kind of resource management strategies up, uh, it's really great to see the progress that we're and steps that we're taking uh, towards trying to build a better pipeline solution for a wide range of developers in the way that Benoit mm -hmm. outlined at the front. Uh, thanks so much for your time today on that. Uh, awesome deep dive. Uh, some great yeah, all right. some great um, feedback in in the chat. And again, thanks again for your expertise. All right. Well, thanks for your attention, folks, and enjoy the rest of the expo. And cool. I'll see you on Discord. All right. Yeah. As Etienne has just mentioned, uh, we'll have a breakout room for integrations at the end of today's uh, Wise Worldwide Online Expo uh, Day Two event, where you can meet with uh, you know feature area subject matter experts and ask questions. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to welcome Guillaume to the live stream. Guillaume! Oh, wait! What's happening? <sighs> I had to make the joke, you know. <laughs> so I'm doing uh, a fake forgot my mute button joke. It was beautiful. But it's the trend, right? It's it's tradition now <sighs> in the wise worldwide online event that's right uh it wouldn't be a live stream produced by me if there weren't <laughs> at least a few mute and unmute hiccups so thank you for acknowledging that a lot of levers behind the scenes not gonna lie yes. so yes. uh and with that i will hand it off to you uh mm -hmm. to give us an overview of staying up to date with wise thanks yeah but I must first share, I'm a bit worried uh, following up on such great presentations from the devs. I mean, I mean, it was great. Uh, they are very awesome. Anyway, so I, I'm just, and you know, day-to-day uh, -day working with them, we don't get to see like fun demos like that. So it's like almost an eye-opener to me too. But yeah, so great work team. And yeah, for the audience, uh, this will be a, a more uh, simple and focused presentation. So awesome. yeah, let's jump into it. Take it away. Simple and focused, but important. So today I want to talk about staying up to date uh, with WISE. Um, so basically because the most asked question by support is what version of WISE are you using, I would believe. Uh, we And this question, uh, well, is important when we're trying to help somebody with a problem. But yeah, uh, we recently started um, publishing this uh, page on, on the website. Uh, it's now in the support section. So when you go to support uh, to reach out to us, uh, you will see this. And so this image has a lot, uh, well, there's a lot of meaning behind all this, but yeah. So it shows that we have the current and the previous uh, major versions of WISE that are actively supported. So basically you're using these, you're good. And you will, we will be there uh, 
to help you uh, quickly if anything comes up. Then uh, the the next category or the um, yeah the anti penultimate version. So yeah, the ultimate and uh, penultimate versions are actively supported. The anti penultimate version, so the orange one, is privately supported. So of course, anybody that has access to support, when they reach out to us with a problem, we will like do everything we can to help. But yeah, so uh, if you're in a, an anti-penultimate uh, situation, you probably uh, want access to support uh, to make sure uh, you can reach out to us. And then the versions older than that, so the pre-anti-penultimate, <laughs> are uh, classified as end of life. And this is a, a bit outdated picture now that 21.1 is out. So uh, it should be updated soon. But yeah, that means 2017.1 uh, today is beyond end of life. Uh, but yeah, so uh, let me expand a bit more on the versioning uh, specifically. So the versions are year dot major dot minor dot bill number uh, but yeah it boils down to two components major and minor are important so a major uh, will introduce breaking change in the api or could introduce breaking change in the api and could change uh, introduce changes to wise that will require you to regenerate your sound banks so, but as soon as long as you remain within one uh, year major release, you're good, and you're you don't need to regenerate your sound banks when you update, and you don't need to worry about incompatibilities with our APIs. They remain the same. And for the minor and build, the build is more information, and it's not really. Um, well, it could be uh, useful information, especially if we're discussing with uh, beta users. So the bill number becomes important there. But apart from that, uh, the minor version um, is just, they're pretty much interchangeable, but the newer ones are always preferred. Uh, because a newer minor has more bug fixes and like, uh, yeah, or even like tweaks that like if a, a version has a problem that gets reported to us that is critical, we will push it in a minor. So that even to, well, depending on the, the severity, it sometimes happened that we have such a problematic issue that we will push a, a change that, you know, will violate the first law. So, <laughs> but that is very extremely rare, so. Uh, I have an example in mind in 2019.2.6, we did break compatibility of communication. So if your runtime is below 2019.2.6, you can't profile with a newer version, but that's like an exception. It's really, uh, our commitment is when you adopt a major, you will be good to update uh, uh, to all the minor versions without uh, breaking API and uh, your assets. And yeah, so that's always my answer to also what que what version of Y should be using. It's always the latest of the major you're on. And yeah, that's, that's the gist of uh, what I wanted to share today, the importance of staying up to date. And it's it's a it's a valued perspective uh, that you bring to this uh, because again I think you're seeing all of these questions unfold in real time from folks reaching out to support uh, and and that idea of you know where should I be what uh, version am I on what do these versions even mean I think again for you mm -hmm. to take the time today and unfold that uh, for folks. Uh, is super valuable. Uh, yeah. Well, if we if you want a bit more of that, like the internal like saying and support, or even like the dev team, uh, we don't want people to ship on a dot zero version of Wise. Yeah. Any team that comes with an issue and says I'm using a dot zero, I'm like, okay, you need to update for sure. Because as much as we like, we do everything to test as much as we can, but 
wise can be used in so many ways in so many places uh, we always find new stuff and mostly our users <laughs> find stuff that we didn't see so yeah so we have this like rule of you should uh, at least have something like a dot three or dot four to ship <laughs> but that can help people choose like if like right like uh, yeah depending on when you're shipping like the big thing you have to ask yourself is at what point in time will i say i can't update any of my tools anymore and that should uh, help you decide what major version you should use and that's it perfect well, you make it sound easy, and I hope folks <laughs> tuned in uh, find their way. And uh, when in doubt, um, there's always support. So good to have you, and good to have your perspective on the live stream today. Always a pleasure. Uh, speaking of which, weather today in Montreal? Uh, Not so great. It's, it's great. Uh, it's raining. Yeah, okay. Well, it's spring. <laughs> yeah, no, and we were, yeah, we had awesome sunshine for, like, it was summer last week. Yeah. In April yeah. in Montreal. Yeah, yeah. That was weird. Teaser. There's a little <laughs> teaser. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right, Guillaume, well, thanks for joining us today, and thanks for bringing your perspective to the online expo. All right. All right, take care. Later. Bye. Uh, well, so that was a fantastic overview from support, and we're lining up the next one for you with uh, Mike Drummelsmith from uh, BizDev. He'll be joining us here shortly uh, and talking more about uh, registering a project uh, and evaluating a wise plugin. Uh, I am excited to welcome Mike. Mike, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm not muted. That's how I'm doing. Ah! That does that mean you're a professional or or not an audio person? I, I can't. It means I'm not an audio person, so I, I, I make fewer audio mistakes. That's right. I'm a business person, and uh, I just have to get things wired up all properly. And I think I actually finally got it working. So, I think you're doing great, uh, and it's great to see you here today. Uh, we are running on time. I want to just give a shout out to all the presenters who. Uh, have preceded uh, this. They're just nailing it timing-wise, and I'm super stoked to be here with you today to talk about this. I'll hand it off. All right. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about projects and uh, when you should start an evaluation, why you should start an evaluation, all the things that make... Uh, evaluations good and useful. So a lot of people ask me, when is the right time to actually register your project? Uh, usually, if you're asking the question, that means it's probably the right time. But sometimes, especially in, in bigger studios, uh, you're kind of just messing around with a whole bunch of ideas, really like super, super concept stuff. Um, that might be a little too early. Odds are you don't need a ton of sounds in that early, early concept stuff. Odds are you don't need funky extra plug-in effects. And you're probably building just for Windows at that point, uh, or maybe iOS or Android if you're doing a mobile game. But you're likely not, uh, unless you're a Sony or a Microsoft, uh, you're likely, or I guess a Nintendo, yeah, of course, uh, you're likely not building strictly for a console with no Windows version to back you up. So that's where, like, if you're still just prototyping concepts, you may not need your license key yet. And you can work with what I always call the unlicensed version. For some reason, still in WISE, it's called the evaluation version. Uh, it basically means you have no license key. Uh, but if you are past that pure concept phase and you really want to start getting working, it is now time to register your project. And literally, there are no good reasons not to do so. I hear a lot of, like, uh, some people will bounce at me with, uh, but uh, we're really worried about our budget right now. Don't, don't care. You don't have to pay anything yet. Um, we don't know exactly what platforms we're going to ship on. Don't care. You're building on some, so go ahead and register your project. So when you're comparing these two things, you, if you just look at what's on the screen there, there's really nothing 
that's on the unlicensed side that isn't on the license on on the on the evaluation side so on the trial license side uh if you have no license key you're going to be limited to 200 sound files on that formal evaluation which again is free you're going to have unlimited sound files uh on the unlicensed side you're only going to be able to access platforms that are what we call open windows mac linux ios android really under that formal evaluation oh you want to access uh, consoles cool you can do so provided that you've done the always necessary validation steps. And those of you who are on the console side of the world know what those are. Uh, and we will tell you if you don't. Um, unlicensed, you have no plugins. And you have absolutely no way of getting plugins. So even if you email me really nice and say, hey, Mike, can I get Convolution Reverb? The answer is no, you don't have a project. So we need somewhere to attach that plugin license to. And under that formal evaluation, you can access all of those. Um, no project in our system, no chance of accessing direct support. So you're going to be on the community Q&A, which while we do try to keep an eye on it from time to time, most of you know it isn't necessarily the best. Uh, Wise Wizards and Witches, shout out to them, always a good option. Uh, but on the formal evaluation, if you are a level B or a level C project, so you have some, some budget or maybe even a big budget, you will have some access to Guillaume, Adrian, the support team, so Phil and, uh, and Julie. Um, on either side, obviously, if you don't have a trial, you're not gonna have to pay anything, that's just obvious. But uh, under a trial, you also don't have to pay anything. So, all right, bonus. Uh, and neither side has any kind of commitment to buy. So when you actually are going through that evaluation process, uh, there will be a license that you are agreeing to, kind of like your terms and conditions in your iTunes or your Photoshop or anything like that. But really the only time that a purchase is made is at the end of that trial phase. Uh, and that trial phase can last pretty much as long as it needs to, um, reasonably speaking, of course. So um, like I said at the bottom, yeah, get, uh, get registered. It's kind of important. So, Let's really quickly run through how to register a project. Hopefully most of you uh, either live here or watching a VOD later know how to do this. Uh, many don't though. So we're going to really quickly, this is kind of the, the really basic rundown. And this is where everything might fall apart when I start switching windows. So I'm going over to, I believe this one. So I'm logged in on the website went to the main page so I don't show you anything you're not allowed to see. Unfortunately, as an admin, I see a lot of stuff on, on this site that isn't public. So you roll over the get wise and you'll see download wise. Everyone here should know that one and register my project. It's right there in your face. So when you go to register your project, you're going to pick some things. Uh, most of you will be working on commercially intended projects. Uh, some of you, if you're kind of messing around with things, um, or, or building something legitimately non-commercial for a school project. Uh, sometimes a charity project will fall into non-commercial for sure. Um, those are the two we'll focus on here. Very rarely, I mean, if you're a plugin developer, you obviously would choose plugin. And if you are a school with courses, this is where you also register your course. But let's focus on these ones. And in fact, let's focus on uh, commercial because that's where my world really lies. Uh, you pick what industry you're in. It defaults to gaming for a reason. 99% of our projects are gaming. And this next choice is another big one. If you say you need less than 500 media assets, this is where you get into what we call the starter license. It's a bit of a misnomer. It's not really just for starting out. It's there if you have a very small budget and not a lot of asset needs it's a free license, uh, works on all platforms. All you have to do is ask, but you have to fit within those boundaries. Um, but again, let's go with what a more traditional trial would be, which is that you need more than the 500 media assets of the starter license. Go to the next page. Now, I am going to skip one step here uh, just because I don't want to waste everybody's time, but let's start actually putting in the project information. So my really, really fake game. I don't have a website yet. And I work at Audio Kinetic. This is the step that is where we skip things. If you have been a member of any other project, any company attached to those projects will show up here. This way, let's say you're um, pick a team like Codemasters. Codemasters makes a whole bunch of games with us. 
every time they register a project, all they do is pick Codemasters. They don't have to put in their address, their company name, and all that stuff. Um, then you pick your contact at Audio Kinetic. I'm going to pick me because I'm selfish. And this isn't really a game because I don't actually make games. Wish I did, but I don't have the smarts for it. Uh, next thing we ask, and these dates can always be changed at any time you want, um, is the rough time you're going to be finishing your pre-production. Guess what? That coincides with roughly when you'll want to buy your license. And then when you want to release, which also could coincide with when you lock down your license if you're on uh, games as a service or royalty model. But let's just say you're gonna, uh, we're going into full production end of June uh, and we're shipping in September. We're really ambitious here. Uh, and we have just a massive budget. Oh my God. Now, this budget slider, we've made it non-granular for a reason. It really just gives us a hint as to where you'll probably lie. The light blue here is what we call our level A range. Here into the darker blue is level B range. And finally, you're in the level C range. This is where all your triple A's live over here. Um, it does have some impact on what you will get as part of your trial. But really, the only thing that it changes is how many support tickets uh, we give you. To be just brutally honest, we can't give uh, open direct support from the support team to everybody who registers a really low budget project, non-commercial project, et cetera, because we'll spend more money on support than we'll make on the games. Uh, and we'll also kill Adrian and Guillaume in the process, which nobody wants to do. So let's set up as a, yeah, we'll go with a high level B. I'm working in Unreal. Uh, I'm 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 got all the secrets, so I'm on Unreal Five, kind of, and I'm starting on the new hotness in Wise, and I'm shipping on just a great mix of platforms. I'm going to be on Stadia, on Switch, and on what's a good one here? Android. Why not? Okay. So now it skipped everything. This is a. Uh, I didn't really want to go into the license agreement either, but I probably should have. Uh, it skips the, because I chose Audio Kinetic, it skips the company. Uh, and because Audio Kinetic uh, doesn't need to sign a license agreement with Audio Kinetic, it skips that process too. If you are registering a new company or a company that doesn't already have a kind of blanket license agreement with us, it will bring you to a step where you agree to those terms. Like I mentioned earlier, you have three options there. You either say, yes, I agree to those terms. You say, I can't, but here's a person who can. And you put in their email that automatically invites them to join the project as somebody who can you know, click accept. Or I can't really agree to these yet and I can't really assign it to anyone else either. That just punts the ball down the field a bit. We will need to get it in place before you actually do any licensing, but you know, what can you do? Sometimes you're just not comfortable clicking through a legal agreement on behalf of your company, uh, and that's totally understandable. So now we end up at a summary page. Uh, this little checkbox is a, a piece of psychological magic we used to just get tons of projects submitted with completely garbage information in them. Like my game's name is A, and I come from company A on A Street. And then we put this little box that says, everything I'm saying in here is true. And I have to check it before I hit submit. And those projects all magically went away. Um, so now I'm gonna submit that. And I wait a little bit and I get a thank you. So at this point, you will also receive an email saying, thanks for registering your project. Uh, I am not going to now go approve this project. I'm gonna pull kind of a Julia Child uh, cooking show uh, thing. And I'm going to look at one I prepared earlier. So under the, that head menu there, which is the accounts menu. So anytime any of us at Audio Kinetic reference account menu, it means the head. Uh, you click on my projects, and it brings you to the projects. And this is the one, it's not exactly the same name I used, but this is the one I prepped earlier. So here you can see uh, at any time I can change the name of my project. I can change the budget of my project. Let's say I got some funding and, I'm get, and, and now I'm gonna be a level C. Uh, it's important info for us to know. So please keep those things up to date. I can change the description, et cetera, et cetera.
Uh, and this one, I've already accepted it. So that's why it says there it's active. License keys, you can see what's here. Again, I changed, oh, I gotta keep denying someone entry here. Um, so here uh, it shows you the wise line lets you know what you can actually build for. The maintenance line, again, it's kind of our, our, an archaic naming, uh, shows you what platforms you have access to. So here I've given myself access to PlayStation 5. And then this top line, it doesn't really impact the license key, but it impacts things like purchasing plugins uh, down the road. So it says all these three platforms are at, are at that uh, level B pricing. But hey, I got this empty plugin block. So what do I do with that? Uh, Let's really quickly jump back then. So, oh, and obviously very important. If you have questions, like as you're filling out the form and you say, eh, I'm not sure what's going on with this, drop us an email. That's my info. You can also write to sales at or licensing at. Ultimately, it all pretty much comes to the same people. Uh, so now we're going to look at plugins. Um, yes, coolness. So, Plugins are obviously the really, really nifty way to extend out the core-wise uh, feature set with awesome extra things. Some of them are made by us. Some of them are made by partners with us on the, on the third-party side. And some of them are made by the community. And we kind of facilitate the distribution of those. But um, we don't maintain them. We don't actively support them. It's really just when, when a... a team in the community has something cool to show uh, and they actually want eyes on it, the best way to have that done is to have it up on our website. Uh, so how do you actually start a trial uh, of a plugin in a project? Well, up until recently, it's been right to somebody at Audio Kinetic and say, can you add this to my project? We got rid of that. Now it's all cool and magic. So you basically have to have that project in the system under your account or else you have, like I said before, you have nowhere to put your plugin. Let's jump back to my completely fake project. Uh, underneath in that license block, you have this where I don't have any plugin licenses yet, but I wanna go explore the plugins. Oh, don't break. Uh, didn't break, good. So now I'm on the Audio Kinetic plugin page. It's also located under products, plugins. Uh, let's say I want to add something that's new and nifty. I want to add Wise Reflect. So I'm going to click Learn More to bring me to the actual Wise Reflect page. And I can read all about it. I can see the pricing of it on the different uh, license tiers. And I can jump here to the full uh, price sheet. Uh, I can see what versions of Wise it works with um, and what platforms it works on. Most, if not all, of the AK plugins, I think with the exception of Motion, work with every platform that we support. Motion's just the outlier because haptics work very differently on different, uh, different platforms. So going back up here, you have the Start Free Evaluation button. I'm going to click that. It says, which, which project do you want to use uh, Wise Reflect on? Now, these are all... The projects I have, and you can see the one I actually created but never approved is sitting there right now pending approval. But I'm going to add it to my completely fake game. It automatically puts in all the platforms that not only the plugin support but are on your project, and done and done. Now, uh, and again, if, if you don't see the project that you want to add it to in the list attached to your account, then you can jump to register and, uh, and, and get the new one in. So now I say start uh, free evaluation. It says thank you. It gives me a date, and when I go back to my projects, boom, I now have a Wise Reflect license. I still have to get the new key in order to reflect that change, but the new key is there. Uh, no intervention from an audio kinetic person needed to approve the request. Um, the timeline on the plugin evaluation, if your Wise Core license is also under evaluation it automatically will sync up with it and if um if you've already purchased your core of wise it will give you 60 days uh that way you have a good amount of time to play around with it and you really shouldn't 
add a plugin to evaluate until you're ready to evaluate that plugin. Otherwise, it's very, those 60 days can go by like that. Um, and then when I chase you and say, hey, are you ready to buy it? You go, I haven't started working with it yet. Uh, and then I extend it again, unless I'm in a bad mood. And I say, you're going to buy it and you're going to like it. Uh, so other things on this page, obviously we have company info, shows Audio Kinetic there, it'll show your company there, uh, who's a member of the project, it's just me. We have a technical spec, so, you know, oh my God, we decided to change engines, we're moving to Marmalade, okay, save. I'll get a notification that you've changed your engine. This is where I said it is good to keep your dates up to date. Um, if I come to uh, July 15th and I haven't shipped my game yet, eh, I should probably update that. Otherwise, your AK contact will think that you shipped your game. Uh, if you have support, see here I have the free plan that came with my level B trial, which gives me two tickets and it's synced up with my, uh, with my evaluation period. And I can create a support ticket from here. That's how you get... Uh, your questions into Guillaume and Adrian. It is limited though, so obviously always look through the documentation, engage the community first if you can. Um, and the document section is where your license agreement will be. Obviously, because I chose Audio Kinetic, it skipped that and didn't attach anything. But if you did click through a document, your click through document will show up here. And uh, I believe if it still works the way I think it works, when you download it, it will populate it with the information on who clicked through and when, um, kind of like a signature, but not a signature. And then private notes you guys don't get to see because that's only for me. Uh, the other really important thing is on almost every one of these tabs, you'll have a button called contact your audio kinetic representative. So whoever was assigned to your project, in this case, me, in other cases, it could be Max, it could be Wenbo over in China, it could be uh, Massa in Japan or in Korea. Um, that is the best way to get an email to your contact if you don't already have their direct email address because it'll go to the exact same place. A lot of people out there uh, just assume they have to go to like the contact us at the bottom of the page and then it comes in through sales at, which isn't a whole other thing and use these buttons. This is, this is exactly what they're there for, to ask us questions about anything to do with your project page. And then the other thing I did mention is that it is important to get the new license key. So in your launcher, in your projects list, you got these key icons next to all your projects. They're really important and I have a feeling not enough of you use them. Uh, so here, these are just projects I've opened on my end. I think none of them actually work, uh, but you can see the status. So on this one that I've called rev test, it shows me what version of WISE it's using. It shows me what license key is there. And it also shows me that that license key is expired. Now, I don't know if this will actually work right now, but all I do is I click on the key and I say update to the latest from the license server. And now that pushes the new license key into your project. At that point, you don't have to do anything. You've got a new key in your project. If you don't have one already attached to it, where this one says free trial, you click the key again and you set the project license. It shows you all of the projects associated with your account from the website. And I am going to, ah, my mouse, I'm going to attach my completely fake game. And now you see, I almost just pointed at my TV for you. Uh, license number is the, the project ID is now the same as the uh, project ID for my completely fake game. Um, this is the correct way to manage your license keys. If you are working through a build system where a build machine needs uh, a license key, you can go back into your project under licenses. You click get license key, copy it to your clipboard, and then you do a step I'm not gonna show you now, which is going into WISE, going into the license manager, which I think is still control L, and pasting it there, saving your project, done and done. A bit more of a manual step. I honestly don't even know if WAPI can do anything with license keys, but uh, I don't know personally really anything that WAPI does because I don't code anything. Back to the uh, Google Slides, covered all of this. You grab your new license key from the project page or preferably from the launcher. 
last thing I want to show you is is what to do when you found a bug. Uh, I did listen to most of uh, Guillaume's talk, but his was more about uh, support and um, like keeping up to date with versions. It is critically important to keep up to date with versions because version different versions do have bugs. That's uh, it's software. It's going to happen. Um, so if you do have a support plan like the free trial support that I showed you in my project, or if you have paid support with your WISE license, you can use a support ticket to report a bug. It's not necessary, um, but it basically means that you're more likely to get a direct response and uh, we, a direct response within a certain amount of time. Um, and under our current support package system, uh, if you do uh, run out of tickets before the time runs out on your support package, anything that like you reported a bug will kick you back as a free ticket. So we really don't like the idea of, of you having to pay to report a bug. Uh, if you don't have a support plan or you don't want to use a ticket um, because like, oh, we're down to three tickets left in our package, uh, what do we do? Then you use the bug reporter. And this is another thing most of you probably have no idea is there. So back to the launcher. Under the question mark menu, report a bug. This is not just for reporting bugs with the launcher. Uh, little behind the scenes uh, news here. I fought with the team a lot on this, saying that it probably most people think that it's just for reporting bugs with the launcher, but it's not. And we do get bug reports on a regular basis through this. So the word is starting to finally get out. Uh, I got to drag this back over to the screen. You click on bug reporter. You don't even have to have a project, but obviously if you do, it's better. Describe your bug, reproduction steps. What did happen? What did you expect to happen? Do you have a workaround? That's obviously very important as well, because that might give us uh, clues on what the issue is. Is it in the authoring? Is it in the runtime? Is it in one of the integrations or the launcher itself? Is it a crash? Is it just a performance issue? Summarize it up. Uh, I'm not going to skip to the next thing, but yes, you can then attach files. So you can attach crash dumps, you can attach uh, sound bank uh, generation logs or any other kind of debug output from your game. And you send a report, it packages everything up and sends it in, comes to our team. People are assigned to triage those bugs, but they are not necessarily assigned to write you back and ask you more questions. Uh, basically, the bug reports are there for things that are not necessarily killing you and your team at this time, but more of a heads up, I found a bug. Uh, if it is something more critical, uh, contact your DevRel representative, tell them that you submitted the bug, and uh, we will make sure eyes are on it. And if necessary, we'll give you a support ticket to report it in through that channel. Um, and that's it. Good. I made it through. And ah, I took too long again. But that's just me. I talk too much. No, it's um, great to have your perspective on things, Mike. And thanks for walking folks through those steps. Uh, again, we try to make it easy, try to make it accessible. And we've built these pipelines to be able to gently direct people through this process of uh, both registering projects, plug-in evaluations, and uh, yeah, getting us feedback on bugs and, uh, and other aspects of their experience, right? Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, to Jay in the chat, I do sometimes get in a bad mood, <laughs> but I try to still be like a bit jokey about it. So yeah, yeah. you won't know, but I'll know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I'll know. Okay, well, uh, and so for folks who are sticking around, uh, we'll drop the link to the Discord chat. Uh, I'll be in the biz dev side, yeah. And so at the end of the live stream, uh, about, uh, I think it's 3.30, uh, no, no, that would be in five minutes. Now. It's going to go around four thirty. Four at about four thirty Eastern time. Uh, we'll drop that Discord server link. You can round up and uh, have a live Q and A with Audio Connect developers in these feature areas and ask more questions. Mike, uh, you'll be there answering questions. Absolutely. Awesome. Thanks so much for your presentation today. Right. Thank you, everyone. Bye now. Awesome. Okay, well, and our day keeps going. And so we're just going to keep bringing the hits to you. I'd like to welcome back to this uh, Mads Moretti and Brock. How are you both doing? Robert Brock, man, good to see you. Fantastic. Good to see you too, Damien. Yeah. All right. Cheers. Thanks for having me. Ah, 
Hallelujah. Uh, I'm so excited for your presentation today on education and certification. And without further ado, I think I'm just going to hand it off. Thanks. Great. Uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is Robert Brock, uh, and I'm actually the director of education at the Conservatory of Recording Arts and Sciences, an audio school based in Phoenix, Arizona, uh, that partnered with Audio Kinetic a while back, many years back, to help start the WISE certification program. Uh, and we're going to talk to you a little bit about that. But I'm also here with my counterpart, Mass, uh, who is uh, <laughs> actually took what we began you know, years ago and took it even further. Mass, you want to mm. introduce yourself? Let yeah. them know. Inspired, inspired by much of your work, actually, like with your one-on-one -on -one and two-on courses and all the other things you do, right? I was the next step, apparently, on the, on the course content and so on. So I, I created the 251 and 301 and also one of the main developers of WAG. And, uh, and now I, mm. I basically just work at Audio Connect doing all sorts of educational stuff so, um, so yeah, yeah, that's just what you do. Just that little bit of, <laughs> yeah. there, right? actually, like I, I, I thought I maybe just to introduce some things about like education you know, at Autokinetic, because like the thing is that at Autokinetic, we often at these uh, situations talk about like certifications, but in, in reality, we do a lot of different educational efforts. Uh, because we think like education is one of like, it's super important to us. So uh, just mentioning some of the other educational efforts, like we do continuously put out blogs or a lot of contributors help us with writing those blogs that also give a lot of educational effort there. There's also like we do live streams like Damien's uh, Wise Up On Air. There's walkthroughs and guides in documentation. We have the audio uh, Q&A where there's a lot of questions and answers and this they stay there so you can go in and read up whatever other might have problems with, and you can get inspired by that. There's something called team training we're going to talk about in a very soon. But um, And we're also very present on the social media. media. But at some point, we'll also have an online seminar for uh, wise educators. So we have a lot of different fronts that we try to educate and bring people up to speed with wise. So... Uh, yeah, but at the at least at this at the core of all of this, we have the, at least the, certif the, the certification courses, the uh, many different courses that are trying to symbolize here with some different uh, floppy disks. For example, we have the one-on-one -on -one course here. Many of these we will go into details in just a second. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I just want to ask you first, Brock. Mm -hmm. So uh, audio connect certifications. Why should someone look into specifically audio connect certifications? Well, I think the main reason is is if you're looking to get into game audio integration, um, and you know, we started with the one on one course. You just held up the mm. uh, copy disc. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of, one of the questions was, how do I get started? And a lot of people that yeah. were interested in doing game audio actually didn't have any experience in in video games. You know, they had a passion for music or they had a passion for sound design, uh, maybe from a different angle, like post production. And it was like, well, well, how does it even work? And so. So mm -hmm. the first step is all of our certification programs are built around the idea that you know really nothing about game audio specifically, that you, you must have a passion for sound, but we're gonna take you from the idea that you don't know anything about it. We're gonna teach, all the courses are really taught from the, end, mm -hmm. uh, from the standpoint of a real world perspective. In mm -hmm. real world workflows, we're gonna expose you to I, the idea of what are those workflows like? Why are they like what they are like? And then, WISE itself is really just the, the product that we're using to show here's how it can work using WISE. Um, and so if you just want to learn how does game audio integration work to begin with, then this is the perfect course because it, mm. it really starts you on the one-on-one -on -one course from, from that level. Uh, definitely if you are a teacher and you're uh, teaching uh, game audio or maybe video games in general and you just now want to add how sound in video games work, it really just gives a nice natural progression, starting from really the assumption that you don't really know anything about it at all. But more importantly, 
is this curriculum is written and endorsed by and 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 highly vetted by Audio Kinetic themselves. I mean, you know, one of the the, the leaders in the industry in, in this field is saying, you know, this is this is our course. This is what we mm. believe somebody should know. And if somebody can demonstrate that knowledge, um, then we will certify them. And that certification will actually give them recognition from Audio Kinetic themselves. And so uh, on Audio Kinetic's website, there's the creator's directory where anybody who achieves a level of certification has that validated on the website. And so it's really great for somebody also who's trying to maybe break into the industry as a resume booster, uh, because again, it's this is all material that's been um, you know uh, overseen through the entire process of creating it, hand in hand with audio kinetic and and it just validates like i said somebody's uh knowledge in the tool not just in how wise works but why does it work the way that it works mm. spot on brock what a fantastic description right. of it all should Good. we uh, should we just go through quickly through the uh, yeah. different courses so uh, starting with the uh, 101 yeah, so the 101 certification, as I mentioned, that was our first certification course, and it was designed with the idea that somebody doesn't know anything about video game sounds at all. Um, we started by literally just not so much looking at whys, but what should somebody know about integrating sound into a video game, and then created a, uh, a course that's very hands-on. So while the, the, the material is written, um, it is very guided, always starting with Here's the, here's the challenge that we have, okay? How are we gonna put this sound into a game? How are we gonna create a three-dimensional, uh, you know, uh, impression of the sound in the world? How are we gonna create more variety in things? How are we gonna understand that we have budgets, not money budgets, but, you know, like data budgets, and why should you even care about that? And then you're gonna do that in a game. And so the, the game that we use is called Cube. And so every single lesson that you go through, you're guided step-by-step step in what needs to happen. And at the end of each lesson, you're gonna build that into the playable game Cube so you can see the result of your work. Um, mm -hmm. And so the 101 course, it really just, you are being introduced to the idea of integration in video games. And you're being obviously introduced to how WISE functions and works as well. Um, and by the end of that course, uh, you're going to have a really good uh, understanding of the overall picture of what it's like to put sound in video games. But I'd also like to say this course, when we wrote it, we kind of thought like, well, we also want to write it with maybe somebody who has video game integration already under their belt, but maybe using different tools. Now they just mm -hmm. want to know why. And I point this to those people as well. So don't underestimate the idea, oh, this might be too simplistic. If you're new to WISE, this is the yeah. easiest first step you could take. You could move through the 101 course over the course of a weekend. And at the end of it, even a veteran user is now going to be very familiar and they're not going to be bored to tears with it. We tried to be, we tried to find that balance between somebody new to video games and somebody who might be experienced in video games, but maybe he's just new to WISE. And we wrote the curriculum with that in mind. Uh, now, as you move Fantastic. into the 201 course, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. we have the uh, just to, just before you head into the 201 courses, we have three specialized courses. Now, just like you said, right, the 101 is the go-to for all the fundamentals, yeah. and for any of the courses afterwards, we'll talk about now. The 101 is a good one to start out with before you head into the next ones. Yes, because the next ones like presumes that you have taken or at least have the knowledge from the 101 courses. Yeah, so uh, 201. I'll have All a right. desk for that, too. Slide. Awesome. <laughs> All right, WISE 201. So the WISE 201 is entirely focused around how do we, in, how do we integrate interactive slash dynamic music into a video game. Yeah. This, when, when we were thinking after, after the success of the 101 course, it was like, what was our next step? This was unquestionably the next step because there was so much uh, feedback from users a lot of film composers out there that want to move into video games, composers just in general that want to work in video games. And there are extremely unique circumstances and thought process behind how you have to compose and think about video games uh, versus a linear based media. And so again, that's the angle we approach the course from. It's like, what does anybody need to know about just the idea of working in a dynamic interactive type of space? How, and then we use WISE as a way to explore, here's how we meet those unique challenges that are in that. And so uh, we had a great team compose music specifically for uh, this course uh, to be able to reveal the different functionalities uh, within uh, the material. Uh, this guy's up at Vibe Avenue. And, uh, and then, uh, 
uh, it's, you know, we take, you know, look at just, uh, uh, you know, again, moving through step by step. It's like, it's always, here's a challenge. Here's how we meet that challenge using wise at the end of the lesson, let's build it into the game and let's play it in the game and let's hear the result of our work in game play. Uh, again, that leads to the 201 level certification. Uh, and so if you're a film composer, or I'm sorry, a composer, I should say, looking to get into video games, this is a great resume booster mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I'll tell you what, in, in game audio today, it's not enough just to be able to compose music and hand it over to somebody else. You mm -hmm. need to be able to integrate it into the game. And honestly, it will change. If you go through the 201 course, um, it'll change the way you think about how you even compose music while you're still in that compositional phase, when you know what the flexibility is of systems uh, within WISE to be able to control and manage that system. Hmm. Uh, so the 101 and the 201 course, both center around this game Cube. I have kind of a version of it over here. Uh, hmm. By the way, uh, we've just actually made a, a uh, a new variant of Cube, uh, what we call the non-lethal version of Cube, had a lot of educators interested in teaching uh, game audio, including down into like the uh, the post second, or I shouldn't say post, like secondary education, high school here in the United States, for example. And um, you know, one of the things our, our previous version of Cube uh, is a first-person shooter game, uh, and that is probably not what a lot of educators uh, really want to be teaching and centering around. And so, uh, where uh, currently the version of Cube that's part of our certification curriculum is based around Cube, the first person shooter. Um, the newest version of WISE that's been released has a new what's called non-lethal version of Cube, where we took all the guns and ammunition and that kind of stuff out of the game. And we replaced it with our wizard with two W's. Uh, and I want to give special props and shout out to Dave Kahlberg, who's one of my uh, co-workers here at the conservatory, because he's been working with this game for a long time. And he actually went in and recoded, recreated graphics and sound design to be able to create this non-lethal so that we can use it as a teaching tool to reach people in all different areas uh, of education. Uh, and so we're excited mm -hmm. about that. The course will be updated uh, for that uh, very shortly. We're actually in the process of that now. And so uh, by summertime, we should have the new non-lethal version of the course materials that go with the non-lethal version of Cube. Uh, mm -hmm. And so- Fanta uh, Fantastic. Yeah, and, and, and I think in the way. description we may have may have a link to exactly this page, where there's more information about this uh, this specific for students. But there's much more to read about the entire update. How will it be more, like how would it affect the uh, your you as a student as maybe you are actually working on the previous uh, version of uh, the certification. But what happens when the new one comes out and such? Absolutely. So, yeah. So we've yeah. kind of planned for that transition. And by the way, yeah, exactly. if you're already a wise educator uh, and uh, uh, and perhaps even like a wise certified trainer, I'm going to talk more about that in just a little bit. We're going to mm -hmm. be giving you more information, uh, hosting some educational elements, uh, talking about these new changes that will be coming up. But for right now, uh, you're going to be fine just as is. Don't worry. We haven't pulled the rug out from you under you. We've kind of planned <laughs> for this transition. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. All right. So, so we uh, the uh, yeah. other specializations that we have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Based about. on based on the work that you did with the one on one, specifically at least, um, I then had the chance to create the two fifty one and three hundred one course. Uh, right, at least at least the courses, and the um, these two courses are a bit different from it uh, the previous ones because they're not longer based in Cube but they're based inside of Unity in the Wise Adventure game. So uh, uh, quite a newer game, but the 251, the first one I'll talk about, is not necessarily thing you, you won't necessarily be working with a focus in Unity. You'll be playing the game from there, but you will be focusing on optimizations inside of Wise. So say you've been making your 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 all your products with 101-based things, you've experimented a lot with different things, and now it's time to learn about what is actually a good thing when you're supposed to release the game. Like, what audio format should I really use? It, there's some about this in the 101, hinting a, a few things in the some light details there, but the, this one goes more in depth with what type of format could be an advantage in what situation. There's also topics on, like, for example, limits. How do you... Make sure you have a good control over all the, the sounds you have in your project, that there's no, no more than three sounds whenever you hit something or hit a crate, or else it would sound maybe worse than the actual result with like with all the tons of sounds. 
Uh, so it's not only an optimization, but also a creative uh, good tool to know. Uh, there's also the f- focus on cross platforms, which is if you have a Windows game, for example, and you are trying to get that on Android, then there's some decisions you have to make in order to which are my important sounds in my soundscape and prioritize some of these sounds and which sound should be cut off on Android depending on how much performance you might have on that device. So all those kind of things, all everything related to optimizations is show like those kind of topics is put inside the 251 course. But don't think as as it of as just a optimization thing. It also can contribute a lot to your creativeness inside of Wise, and your knowledge about, for example, cross platforming. Um, okay, so next up, there's the 301 course, which is that one is specifically focused inside of Unity, the integration inside of Unity that we provide. And here you'll get around all the basics of dragging and dropping components onto different game objects and so on. We, we will also go a bit more in depth. So you will learn that is the nature of u- using Unity. You will may learn how to create a script and write simple lines of code. It's not necessarily something that it, it's not a, a programming course. So fear not, it's just you will learn the exact line of code that you need in order to have the amount of control that is desired when you cannot do it from components. So it, it gives a lot of uh, abilities to the sound designers themselves if they can just do a bit of coding, even though they don't understand what uh, the programming language might be, they can still add some lines here and there and get a long way. So less dependency on having a programmer or a game developer to do your integration stuff, but you can actually do it yourself. So that's why you want to take the three on course. Yeah, I want to uh, but on, that's on, on Matt's because I, I, I was like, I had no knowledge of like the Unity side of anything at all and definitely not the programmer. And when I went through your course, I can't tell you how many aha moments I had uh, <laughs> as, I, as I moved through that material. Uh, and I think the other thing that I took away from that is even in a production environment where there's going to be programmers involved, I felt like I came out of that knowing so much more about the programmer's perspective on things, even though could, I had just enough of a hook to mm-hmm. understand how things tie in with Wise to be able to communicate with other people on the team. Uh, so mm-hmm. I, that's, I really yeah. took away a lot from your course. Yeah. Cool, thanks. <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's the three specialization courses on top of the one-on-one, mm-hmm. but there's that's actually not it. If we go to the webpage, you might see that, uh, let's go here, like learn that there is the... 101, 201, 251, and 3 on course. But there's actually more than that. There's also a teach wise section here. And that is, and here we start to we can start to talk about like the certification instructor course and also something called 110. So maybe you want to talk to us about what that really is, Mark. Yeah. So if you're an educator or uh, might want to move into education and educating about game audio, um, Audio Kinetic has a, uh, as a program for uh, having people become WISE certified instructors. And this is a, um, how that works is it's a very rigorous process. So uh, it doesn't necessarily assume you have any prior teaching experience, although that might be desired. What, what it's really about is, do you have a passion for sound? Do you have a passion to want to share your knowledge with other people? Uh, and if you are looking to teach in an educational environment, whether it be a college, a university, a high school, or maybe even a place that does what we call short course offerings, like two, three, four day type offerings around a particular topic, um, then that's what the, the train the trainer program is. And so to become a wise certified instructor, you must move through a train the trainer program. Uh, and so the train the trainer program is a four day program for full days about not it's, it's not even so much about wise it's about how do you provide quality instruction in a group-based environment in a hands-on environment using wise uh, and it's and it's really about how do you interject yourself using the framework of for example we use the 101 course as our framework so so you have to be able to deliver the material as a certified instructor that that audio kinetic has has uh, uh, sort of given their blessing to 
But we want to see people deliver it in a way that is unique to them and is personal between uh, that instructor and their students. And so we spend four days in that process between talking about what the expectations of an audio kinetic wise certified instructor is. And then to become a certified instructor, there's really three uh, things that need to be done. Uh, tests, I, could, I guess you could say. There's, there's an instructor version of the written 101 test, uh, which is required for certification. There is a uh, hands-on proficiency demonstrating uh, someone's ability to actually use the software. Knowing the software and using it are two different things. So we wanna test both sides of that. And then most importantly, um, there's a piece that involves teaching sections of the WISE curriculum to the rest of the participants in that group. Uh, and that's something that's really, there's the most amount of emphasis um, placed on. And, uh, Maz, you were uh, in, involved in one of my train the trainers not too long ago. Um, yeah, I was just about more to say More or less than you expect. I'm kind of curious about that because a lot of people aren't really quite sure. It's like, what are we going to do with four days? You know, I know everything about WISE <laughs> that there is to know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not but, really about like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you say it so perfectly because like the the WISE Certified Instructor course is not necessarily about focusing on WISE. It's it's so much more about like looking at teaching methods for advanced things because game development uh, or audio integration today is just an advanced topic. And so when we have to think about how can we comprise this down to something that as anybody can like a sound designer that hasn't been exposed to any game development before, right? How can we teach such advanced topics to those? It really, like, uh, I think it's one of the things I took away from that course was how powerful, for example, metaphors can be, how important it can be to associate things that you might want to explain or, or educate someone about into material things and that makes it different than, than just like looking at a screen, looking at wise, maybe just a property that's not necessarily recognizable. But if you associate it to something else, you, you suddenly have another way to remember it. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's a ton of good teaching methods in that course. And I learned a lot from it. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And by the way, if you are an educator, um, this course absolutely falls into continuing education. And so if you're at a school or a district that requires some type of continuing education, um, this is all about, you know, how to be a great teacher, how to be a great instructor, and it can qualify, you know, for that in most cases with a district. So absolutely. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so the certified instructor course and the uh, 110, right. But, but is, is some, th something separate from the 101, 201, yeah. uh, 251 and 301, but keep in mind, and I'll, we, you probably heard this before, but all the, the uh, certifications that we talked about in the beginning, all the four courses there, are all the content of that is free. Yeah. So keep that in mind when you're looking through what you want to learn about it. it. You aren't necessary to pay to get the content itself. You can go in there, learn all the material, but in order to get the stamp on that you've uh, appro you approved to, uh, to, to use this, to, to do this topic, like for example, WISE 101, if you are approved in using the fundamentals of WISE, then you go through the exam, you get a certification that you can show to uh, employers all around the world to, to verify that you are, yeah, you can use WISE. So a lot of this is free to, to use if you just want to try it out and such. Yeah, yeah. and that brings me on to uh, something that happens pretty much every year, right? But we have some discount codes for anyone who wants to buy the exam. Uh, shown here for 101, 201, 251, and 301. And uh, it lasts until May 31. But if you want to think about, like, you don't have time to start the course before May 31, then no problem. Just as long as you buy the course before that date, you can just head into the course whenever you, you want to and take the exam. So just make sure to buy it before that date. Yeah. Yeah. And one of the, uh, Maz, you mentioned 110 certification and I didn't expand on that, but what one yeah. certification is you may see people on the creator's directory with that particular certification. 
That particular certification is not something you can just take a test online for. Mm -hmm. The only way that you can get a 110 certification is by demonstrating hands-on through a practical exam, your skill on WISE. And the only place where you can actually take that exam is with a WISE certified instructor at an audio kinetic uh, endorsed educational institution. And mm -hmm. so that's another thing where if you uh, become a WISE certified instructor, you bring that ability to bring that heightened level of recognition that this student has demonstrated demonstrated in front of me their ability to use WISE uh, as opposed to just their knowledge of WISE. And so uh, the 110, uh, the reason that doesn't show up on that is because that's not something that could be done online. Yeah. Uh, and so look for um, uh, schools that might be offering WISE certification courses mm -hmm. if you're interested in taking a WISE 110 certification exam. Exactly. So that's pretty much for uh, for our talk, but just uh, last detail for schools, if you are interested in getting licenses for your students that are supposed to use WISE, remember that if you create, uh, sign up on our website, create a course, you get no asset cap on the with the license that you get in there. Uh, so uh, make sure to register your school so you can get that extra license for, uh, for your WISE projects and just use it without any problems or any limits. All right? Okay. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, you two, for the like just <laughs> professional level execution of the educational resources. You, your walkthrough really was, uh, you know, high level informative, uh, but went deep to the heart of all of the resources we have and kind of the, the passion behind it here at Audio Kinetic. You know, this investment in education, this investment in interactive audio. Uh, is at the heart of what we do. And so thank you for your representation on that. And uh, Damien, I feel like we got to give you a little bit of a nod too, because the Wise Adventure <laughs> yeah. game uh, didn't just come out of thin air, it came out of yeah. your wonderful mind. So thanks yeah. uh, thanks for planting that seed for us to, to, to follow up with. You're welcome. And the adventure may have started long ago, but it's good to still be <laughs> on that adventure <laughs> with everyone here. So yeah. thanks so much today. Uh, right. We're going to transition. Uh, I'll say goodbye to you, uh, Brock. Take care. And again, right. thanks for right. everything. Uh, and we'll see you next time. Right. All right. Um, meanwhile, Mads, I'm setting you up for the next presentation while your co-conspirator, a wild Simon Ashby, has joined the chat. Welcome, Simon. Hello. Hi, Simon. Awesome. Hi, Mads. Well, and I'm counting on the two of you to uh, carry this educational piece forward to the end of our second half of day two, and I'll turn it over to you now. Yeah. Thanks. Good. I think it's uh, the last session today. So, uh, <laughs> all right, let's keep the energy up and <laughs> finish that. Um, great. So um, we wanted to talk about uh, something new and something that's been available on the website seven minutes ago. So the team <laughs> training. So it's now live, <laughs> just in time. And so what is the team training? So so we just went through uh, the certifications process and so on. And certifications are like like really comprehensive and, and really complete programs on, on, on certain topics and so on. But it's, it's just not possible to cover everything about WISE under a certification necessarily. Sometimes because it might not be enough content or sometimes uh, because, for example, we were talking about spatial audio just before uh, the, this afternoon. And... So this thing is moving constantly, and we're still not at a place with spatial audio where we're ready to do a certification on it because every new release of WISE, things are changing, improving, evolving mm. quite a lot. So we would have to redo the certification like every year. So, <laughs> so but there will be one, that's for sure, but <laughs> we're, we're not not yet. So, so. So we have all our video material, the documentation, the certification, and the team training, we believe is the thing completing uh, the full circle, basically. Mm -hmm. um, so what is a team training? It, it's basically, it's a, it's a two day or more uh, hands-on training. So hands-on is important there. Um, that is tailored to your needs, basically. And this is something that is that is really important to us. And, and we've done a share of, on-site training in the past. I've done that many times and 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 it was fine and it was great because you get to meet people, you spend a few days with them and, and always the concern was to make sure that 
um, what do you need to learn? Like, what, what are the blind spots or what are the, the needs uh, precisely for your team uh, from now on for your next projects and so on? So we want that customization uh, at the forefront of that thing. So, so now we're, so we're arriving with that. It will take an online format. And why are we doing that now as well? The, another reason is because now we have the right people on staff at Audio Kinetic in China, in Japan, and in the rest of the world to deliver those team training basically across the globe um, there. So this is, um, this is just the right moment to do that. So, um, so, so the benefits for the team that we're seeing in that is, again, customization. So it might be you're just starting with WISE. Um, you might start with a 101 certification. And it's probably good if you do it uh, before, but then you might just it might just be easier for you and your team to learn with a with an actual trainer and it's hands-on and, and you get like instant feedback. Or it might be that you're in between two projects and you have some time to resource and, <laughs> and research and explore things. And maybe it's the right moment to learn about object-based audio and, and decide to tackle the spatial audio thing. So why not offering to you and, and the rest of the audio team at your studio a team training uh, that is dedicated to that? Then, Mets, you, you're going to show like the various things that we in a yeah, minute. Yeah, I'll, the, I'll show some of the points in the list. Yeah, you can pick from. In a, exactly, in a second, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and and the benefits there there are also benefits for us uh, at Audio Kinetic because um, so basically helping any teams using Wise is directly part of our mission, right? It's it's <laughs> that's that's our DNA. That's why why we're there. So anything that can help you speeding up your velocity or reducing frustrations and like whatever, anything that helps having the WISE community more proficient uh, with the software is directly helping our mission and, and our vision for uh, what we do and what we want to do in the future. Mm -hmm. um, it, but it's also a really good moment for the, the trainer to, to keep in touch with the developer's reality, right? What are the trends and what goes well with WISE, but also what could go better with WISE, those are really important thing. And just having this relationship and being closer to the people is, is also a way for us to guarantee that we, we stay current and, and we're really at the forefront of where things are heading. Uh, so that's important. And finally, maybe the last point I'd say is, <laughs> well, any team that is more, uh, that is better with the software and so on, uh, chances are that it, that's going to be reducing the number of support cases, right? So we, we used to say <laughs> internally that the best support case is the case that never need to be written and sent to, to our support, right? And that might be because we added new features to the profiler that helps you, or it might just be because you understand better some of the subsystems uh, at play in WISE. And those are things that can be learned through uh, Teams training. So, um, so yeah, so that's a, in a nutshell, uh, the <laughs> idea and the motivation on our end to, uh, to formalize um, our, our team training our, or basically our training offer uh, out there. So, uh, so Matt, yeah, let's, cool. let's go yeah. to... Uh, let's, uh, let's see how, they, how you yeah. actually get it. Yeah, uh, So um, going on to the AudioKinic website, I was just there, but you will go just to go to the front page here. You'll see in the top here, learn. There's a learn wise, teach wise, and then there's the new category that I've totally got to practice clicking on um, that appeared for seven minutes ago. And <laughs> in here, you'll learn a lot more information about what team training really is. You can see what the pricing is. You can see that we also, also uh, deliver recordings of it. And you can click request team tra training. And once you do that, You'll get this screen where you can see my uh, information for contact, uh, also my job title and so on, and the project that I'm supposed to be uh, assigned to. We need to have some product to, to uh, associate this team training with. And then for now, it's mainly online, but uh, at some point, maybe there will be something uh, with on-site, but I'll choose online for now. And then there's a ton, ton of topics here. Now, Many of these topics you'll see, like wise fundamentals, interactive music, optimizations, on Unity integration. Much of this is inspired by our certifications. So it's it's pretty much also the same titles. 
but that's just suggestions for what you could be taught in a team training sessions. And there's also a bit about uh, Unreal here and spatial audio. So once you pick some topics here, and like there's something on this list that I need that is not there. Well, I can go to the bottom here where are there any other topics that you were hoping to learn about? Well, I can write Wappy or Waggle. And once I add it to that list, we, once we get the request, we will see if we can find the best trainer for you who knows about these things. So it's think about this list as it's not limited to this list. It's just suggestions for what you could be taught there. Uh, additionally, there's also some information about your team because it's important for us to know what kind of team are we supposed to teach these things and what experience do they have? Uh, how do we tailor these things to your needs? Uh, so fill out that and submit the form and agree to the terms and we'll find a trainer for you and get back to you. Um, yeah. And yeah. And, 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 say this is, and this is basically after this has been submitted, this is when the discussion starts, right? So we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get in touch exactly. with you. We'll discuss yeah. and we'll make sure that we really understand well where, where you're at and, yeah. and maybe propose alternative to some of the choices and, <laughs> and other things. So, exactly. We really want it open and we really want it to be exactly what the team needs as, at this mm. moment in time and at that, the end of this process. Like you, mm. you, you get everything you wanted basically at the end of it. So. And to make that like, to make that discussion even more clearer, we will, the first thing we'll have after submitting this form is a lead trainer meeting, which means that the trainer and the lead of your team is supposed to sit together for an hour, talk about like things like, how can we tailor the content to your team? Uh, setting time estimations is two days enough for all the things you want to teach your team. Uh, when is it supposed to? Be? The planning of it is uh, how urgent is it? Uh, what kind of expectations might you have of doing this team training? But also, how do you like to teach uh, get taught something? Like, how do you like to learn things? Because that that is very vi vi vital to some of the resources that we as trainers are supposed to find uh, additionally to the actual team training sessions. We'll find a lot of resources like uh, documentation references, all the things we talk about and videos and so on. And we'll, of course, try to find things that make sense in your way of learning. So if you're a visual learner, maybe we'll use a lot of video references, right? So that's the first meeting that we'll, we'll look into how we can tailor it. And just to give you some example of how to tailor uh, uh, how we would look at tailoring this, this experience to you. Uh, say that you are a game developer that is making mobile games and you are looking into just learning about WISE. Well, how could you use WISE in your games? Uh, pretty much the same things as in 101 maybe. Well, in that case, I think I may, my, may uh, look more into, it could be something like optimizations because you are on a mobile you are making mobile games, and so the optimizations becomes a more vital part of your game development. On the other side, if you are doing high-end uh, game development, like uh, for like PC games, uh, FPS shooters with a lot of spatial audio and such, we, we can look bigger on features. We can look into, for example, also dynamic influences by RTPCs in your music systems and having many layers in your music systems and such. So that definitely sets a stage for how what, what needs you might have. And that's why it's also very important, the more you add in, of information to this site, the better. So we can do some proper tailoring of our content. Uh, some practical things, Simon already mentioned, uh, it's two days or more, and it's gonna be mostly hands-on. So there's of course gonna be some like some schedules and it's gonna be presentation and there's gonna be some things that is easier to explain in theory with a slideshow, right? But most of it is gonna be hands-on so you can follow along closely on, say you are have, having your project on your own screen there and on a secondary monitor you have the trainer. So you do the exact, exact thing, same thing as the trainer does. And if there's something that is confusing and so on, I usually say to uh, the teams I'm teaching that keep your mics on so I can hear that, ah, or, uh, uh. So, so I'm actually sure that you are following or not. Uh, and I can kind of, uh, okay, maybe I went too fast in that place and I'll have to go a bit back. It's also a very nice place for asking questions because 
uh, if it's hands-on, it's just a procedure we're going through. It's not a video that you need to pause uh, and so on. Um, but there's undoubtedly going to be things that I cannot write uh, answer right on the spot. Uh, if that happens, the good thing here is that, and I also showed this, this on the uh, list here, that it's the it delivered by an autokinetic ed educator. So it's already someone inside the environment of autokinetic who knows many of the developers. And so we will most likely be able to figure out who to ask that specific question and get an answer and then get back to you the day after or in a separate email. Um, and lastly, for practical things, I just want to mention that you, you with your acceptance, we can also record the sessions so that any new team member that comes into your team can watch the same thing that you went through and get up to speed uh, quite fast, just like the rest of your team with, uh, with the same content. So, uh, and so lastly, I think the thing I just wanted to mention was like on the website for more information, go to learn team training. If you have any questions, then we have an email right now on team training at audioconnect.com. But otherwise, we'll be on Discord afterwards in the education uh, channel. So come in and ask us any questions you want to. Yeah. Uh, Anything else, Simon? Well, we we um, I think we can say that we already we've done it a few times already. So we we yeah. test drive uh, that formula and and for example, um, recording the the training session. This has been at the request of one of the game developers, and actually we said, "Wow, that's smart. <laughs> we should have thought about that from the beginning." So yeah. so they they requested it, so they have access to the recording and so on. So and sometimes you know we we're we also understand the reality, your reality. So you're there, but who knows? You might have to leave for an hour to do another meeting for a project mm. that will be greenlit soon or you know um life of being a developer <laughs> so uh so those are just just like good and practical elements and and when Metz, you were referring to this uh, this conversation with the, the team lead on their side and, uh, and yeah, you, yeah. for example yeah. if you're the, the trainer there so again the idea is the more transparent the more you we know about your thing the, the easier for us it is to customize mm -hmm. our content if we know that you've always done first person perspective games and now it's your first game with third person perspective well that changes a bit like how you manage your positioning and mm -hmm. distance attenuation yeah. your the placement of the listener and those kind of things so we can prepare for that or, or for mm -hmm. example if you're mostly have your your sound designers there but if your programmer is wondering if you should come, well, yes, please invite your programmer <laughs> and we'll prepare also things that fits for that. Like, yeah, this is how yeah. you use the system in WISE, but by the way, through the SDK, you're going to call those functions, for example, yeah, exactly. from your game engine, you know, just to, to get the full loop uh, with your team. So mm -hmm. uh, again, custom made, tailor made for you, adapted, that's the, that's the spirit for this new uh, team training program. Exactly. Well, then yeah. it's a great overview of this new initiative, team training uh, for Audio Kinetic. And a question came up in the chat. What about um, QA? Uh, how to profile and debug in a project? Is this a good candidate for something like team training? Totally. <laughs> that's, a, that's a perfect. I, I, usually try to, I usually say that that one thing that you learn in team training is not just like the, the mechanics, but also how to apply it, but also how to troubleshoot things and use the diff variety of profilers to fix your problem in a, in a, in a good manner because you're most likely going to have a product for release, right? So it's very important that you have a solid implementation of your sound. So, and yeah. that's probably a new checkbox to add to the list because troubleshooting <laughs> yeah. or profiling is not listed there. So that's a really yeah. good cue from uh, from the, the, the chat. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. It's almost like a plant, although uh, I know it wasn't. Uh, but a very, very <laughs> insightful question. And uh, it fell right in right in line. So thanks so much uh, to the two of you for uh, for that excellent overview of this new offering. Team training. Folks, uh, queuing up for that. Uh, and thanks again for helping me round out the end of day two. Great. Thank you, Damien. All right. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Well, here we are at the end of day two. I think we're almost there. 
Uh, we had a great talk up front today from Wise Automotive and the innovation team talking about uh, sounds for electronic vehicles. Uh, we went deep on all of the spatial audio features offered as part of Wise 21.1. Uh, some fantastic and accessible presentations on spatial audio and WISE uh, using Unreal as well as profiling. Uh, the second half of the day went deep into Unity addressables and using WAPI in Unity, uh, this accessibility slice that gets you deeper into the asset management side of things. Uh, we talked about staying up to date with your WISE versioning. What's the best practices there? Registering your project and evaluating the plugin. Education and certification. And then lastly, here with this new team training initiative, uh, it has been a fantastic day too. I want to give a big shout out and thanks to all of the WISE developers uh, who participated today, presenting and sharing their knowledge, sharing their experience and expertise. Like this is what uh, we live and breathe here and to be able to bring this to the community is a gift. So that's day one it was fantastic. We talked about a ton of cool features in WISE, uh, object-based audio. We talked about the authoring plugin API, the impactor plugin and WAPI and Wackle. Uh, and today we just ran it down. Uh, I think this, puts a cap on the WISE Worldwide Online Expo for 2021. Uh, it is a much different year this year than it was last year when we first gave this whole online expo thing a try. Uh, we are super stoked to be able to bring this information about the latest release uh, to you and try to give you this understanding of the new cool stuff in the box that we've worked and develop over the last uh, year or two. So we hope it's been informational. Uh, throughout the live stream, we've dropped a bunch of uh, ways for you to interact with us, uh, different channels to communicate, different resources that you can leverage. And so we really hope that you dig into this new version and the features there and provide some feedback for us. Uh, if you've been following along today, we have a Discord channel that we're spinning up now. You can head over there as soon as you're ready uh, with multiple rooms for uh, the features that we've been talking about. And you can speak directly with developers from Audio Kinetic, ask questions, get further insight into some of these subject matter areas, uh, and, and really you know answer some questions that you might have after uh, after participating today in the live stream. So uh, for those of you who hung on tight over these, uh, I think somewhere between six and eight hours of extreme interactive audio, uh, I'd like to say thanks. And it's been a pleasure to connect with the community here during this time. Uh, I look forward to hearing more about all of the things you're doing with WISE. Uh, that is a pleasure, as always, to experience the craft and art of interactive audio. Uh, thank you again to all of the developers. Uh, and again, shout out to the Asia teams who are helping to bring this to our audiences uh, overseas. That's it. Signing off from the WISE Worldwide Online Expo 2021. See you over in the Discord rooms. Uh, and I wish you the best this year in your interactive audio authoring. Signing off. Have a good one. Thanks so much.